This is the March 28, 2024, regular meeting of the Board of Directors of Reston Association. Um, I wanted to uh, do a couple of things before we begin the regular meeting. First, as, as I was reminded by our treasurer, um, our community lost a really important person recently, and her name was Liz Knapp. And if anybody held this community together, the secretary of South Lakes High School was one of them. Uh, all four of my kids went to South Lakes High School, and all four of my kids and my ex-wife and I all loved Liz Knapp. She made life for our families in Reston and at South Lakes High School much better than it would have been without her. And um, as they said in the movie Brian song, when you hit your knees tonight, think of her, because we're a weaker community and a, a less strong community uh, for the loss of Liz Knapp. She was a wonderful, wonderful human being and a really good racing tout when it came to the Derby. Um, the other thing we want to do is to recognize the triumph of the South Lake Seahawks basketball team as they win for the first time in high school history, in South Lake's history, the state championship in basketball. Um, that's something that even the in, uh, famous and well-storied and honored uh, Grant Hill did not achieve during his time uh, at South Lakes High School. But we want to congratulate the team and congratulate the coaches. Uh, exceptionally well done all. The other thing we want to do is we want to congratulate our Chief Operating Officer, Peter Lusk, for having been named for, on, of the, among the 40 for 40 by the Washington Business Journal. So congratulations on that. Um, every year, the Washington Business Journal identifies young up-and-coming uh, executives uh, who have a, a future <clears throat> promise. And uh, the only thing we can hope for with that is that it doesn't encourage somebody to uh, recruit you away from our <laughs> continued excellent service. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention before we get into adoption of the agenda is that some of you may have seen a board matter uh, by our um, supervisor, Mr. Alcorn, wanting to do an inventory of the various and sundry, um, and they used, he used a derogatory term that I wish he had chosen otherwise, the alphabet soup agencies here in Reston. As we all know, this association provides the majority of service of recreational open space services to the community, as well as a large number of other services. And we hope in the process of the county staff assembling that inventory, that that preeminence is recognized uh, and continued to be valued on the part of all those looking at that inventory. Um, with that, I'm going to ask for unanimous consent to adopt the agenda with one change in order to um, enable um, staff to go home earlier, I'd like to take up item L um, before item K. Item L is the lessons learned. We had a videotape and here we are. Good evening, Madam Vice President. I know you're fine. Um, I'd like to have the uh, uh, with unanimous consent to adopt the agenda and just move L in front of K so that most of these are informational items that I want to get the informational items out of the way. Sir. I would like to further amend the agenda sir. and the consent calendar by adding the names of appointees uh, for the Lakes Equity Working Group, the chair, Niradso Longenacre, and the vice chair, Sureka Sweeter. Okay. Any objection? No. Hearing and seeing none, uh, that, um, that amendment to the agenda is added under the consent. I need to see Brittany. I can't see Brittany. You got it? I, I don't want to move so far that you can't ca capture that. And uh, the change to moving L in front of K. Is there any objection to the adoption of the agenda as amended? None. None. Hearing and seeing none and seeing Director Dodd uh, quiescent <laughs> that the, the agenda is adopted. And the first order of business is uh, member comments. I'm uh, given to understand that we have no one, there's nobody in the room, but is there somebody online to for a member comment? Tom Hall. 
Tom Mulcairin. Tom Mulcair. It looks like Tom Mulcairin. Mr. Mulcairin, former board member. Lo happy to have you here tonight, sir. Uh, go ahead. You have three minutes. Can you give us your address, sir? One second. I need to unmute him. And President Farrell, I'd like to just bring to your attention that uh, Director Perry also appears to be participating online. Oh, okay. I was given to understand that you wouldn't be able to join us tonight, so glad to see. Oh, there I see it. Okay. I see someone logged in in her name. I do see it now. Thank you, Director Dodd. Ms. Mulcairy. Hi. <clears throat> Mr. Mulcairy, you've been unmuted. Okay. Uh, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to talk for a few quick minutes. Um, my name is Tom Mulcairn. I live at 2030 Lake Winds Drive. Um, I've been a, a resident member for over 30 years. As uh, John just mentioned, a past director on the, the board of directors. Um, I'm an officer on my local cluster, and I own an electric vehicle. Um, the reason I'm speaking tonight is because a group of Reston members from a variety of clusters in South Reston uh, got together and presented a proposal to, to RA to have electric vehicle stations installed at the Ridge Heights pool. Um, our neighborhood is mostly townhouses, so the cost to install a personal charging station in front of a townhouse is between six and $12,000. Uh, currently, RA staff is working on details, but since the makeup of the current board may change very soon, um, I wanted to just give the basics of the proposal for everybody. Um, our group leader, Norm Happ, reached out to a vendor, Greenspot, who had a simple business plan. Um, install systems in high traffic areas. Greenspot will install and maintain their systems at no cost to rest in association with a 15 year contract. They only get paid when their systems are in use, which alleviates the problems of chargers that are not working like many places you run into. Um, RA can add a nickel for every kilowatt that's used when charging a vehicle, resulting in non-member revenue. Uh, during my time on the board, a huge amount of our time was spent discussing how to raise non-member revenue. This proposal provides RA with the opportunity um, to generate over $5,000 per pool annually or $75,000 over the life of the contract per pool. So with 16,000, I'm sorry, with six, 16 pools, RA has the potential to generate over 1.2 million in non-member revenue while providing our membership with a much needed service. I wanna thank the board for all the service that you guys do. Um, and I wanna thank you for letting me speak today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCarran. Um, anyone else? I see some other people online, but is anybody else wishing to speak to the board? I don't see any other people <clears throat> in the chat requesting to speak. Okay. All right, then we'll move on. Uh, can I have a motion to adopt a consent agenda as amended? So moved. A motion by Director Petrine, second by du <laughs> Director Mappar. Any objection? Hearing seeing none, the consent agenda is adopted as amended to add the chair and vice chair of the Lake Equity Group. Um, CEO update, Mr. Cummins. Uh, I don't have anything extra for you tonight. Just put a few items in your agenda to, um, in your packet so you're aware. Um, Mr. Cummins, in your um, update, there was a conversation about the Shadowwood renaming process. Um, I've talked to some members of the board. I think that doing the town hall during the transition um, might, between the current board and the new board is an uncomfortable moment for us. And I'm wondering if we can't push that off to uh, May or something like that. That's A. The other question I had is prior to the Shadowwood renaming being raised, we had a conversation and actually had a meeting that one unfortunately was tragically cut short uh, about renaming Lake Audubon. So that's kind of ahead of the Shadowwood in the queue. And I was wondering <laughs> when did we have an intention of revisiting that issue since that meeting was interrupted by a health emergency. Director Perry has her hand up. I, I'll get to you. Yep. So, so two two parter. Um, I'm going to turn over to Peter. When when we looked at a potential schedule for Shadowwood renaming, there's a couple components there. Um, first issue is the board asked us to move on this, um, and I don't remember the exact meetings, but it came to Bach, and Bach directed us not to bring it back to the board to discuss process, but rather to just get going on it. 
and have it done, I think, by the end of the first quarter or so, um, with the intent to line up <clears throat> any potential renaming with the actual opening as we got into the springtime. So that's why the schedule laid out the way it did in terms of the town hall, you know, and those sorts of things. Understood. Um, in terms of the Lake Autobahn renaming, um, that has been in the queue, and we brought it up multiple times, how would the board like to proceed or get it, you know, back on the agenda. The board's given us direction on Shadowwood, so that's why that's moving forward. Okay. Um, I, I still I stick with the idea that April 15th might be inconvenient for the board, but Director Perry wanted to be heard. Well, I, I thank you, uh, President Farrell. I, I, I appreciate what you're saying, that the Lake Audubon uh, meeting was scheduled, but the Shadowwood neighbors have been asking for that name change to happen for years. And so I think to continuously put it off and put it off, it is at this point, once again, ignoring member requests to at least go in and see what can be done and get it moving. And the reality is, is now is a great time considering that that pool is about to reopen this summer. Okay. Um, just to clarify, this matter came before the full board on in May, uh, strike that, in 2011. And the board voted and voted it down. So this, this community or this group of people who are interested in this have already had their day in court. That doesn't mean I'm not gonna give them another one, but I, I believe, and I, can I get a motion to defer that hearing until May? So moved. I have a second. Second. <clears throat> second uh, made by Mr. Flashman. Do, second. Do you, do you, I'm just want to make sure I'm clear on the motion. Um, moving the entire process not to start till May or just the town hall meeting? The town hall. Um, I don't, was there some other part of the process other than the town hall that I'm missing it, in your- there, There's your, on, online feedback and a whole bunch of other things that are relating to- I, I'm focused the on the town hall. It's the timing of the town hall. The object is to move the town hall to May. That's the motion. Did I understand the motion correctly? Okay. Discussion on moving the town hall to May? Any objection to moving the town hall to May? Director yes. Petrine, I thank you. Then I'll call a vote on it. Director Petrine? I think if we uh, keep it in early May, so it can be, uh, since there's going to be uh, April 25th board meeting, correct? Right. Um, there will be time for discussion and it will give uh, staff time to publicize, publicize it appropriately and begin to generate interest from the community. That's fair. Uh, and, uh, other, other people wishing to speak to the motion? Director Perry, you're, you're opposed to it, so we'll have a vote on it, but did you want to speak in opposition to the motion? I, I don't. Getting community input to bring, bring back to the board, even the new board, does not affect the new board in any way until the information is brought back. I find it extraordinarily unfortunate that this board is once again hampering movement on this. Director Johnson. Um, I'd just like some clarity on what awkwardness we expect there to be in the transition, like why, why does it have to be? The, the, the new board will, will not have been in place for even a week when this town hall is being held. And I think that they yeah, the courtesy to any new board members that they would need to have a meeting at the end of April so they can make inquiries and that, that kind of thing. So I'm talking about a delay of three or four weeks. One, two, yeah, three weeks. Further discussion? Yeah. Director Dodd? Just remembering my own introduction to the board and what a challenge it was. Um, I do favor moving this uh, as long as the move can be to early May and not constitute a substantial delay. But I think letting the new board members get their feet on the ground uh, is reason enough for me to support this motion. I think we're ready for a vote. All those in favor of directing staff to postpone the town hall meeting until early May, say aye. 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 That's Director Mappar, Director Chesek, Director Petrine, Director Flashman, Director Dodd. Opposed? Director. Aye. 
Thank you, Director Perry. <laughs> Director Johnson, Director Greywich. Motion carries. Go ahead, Director. Can I follow up? Mac, did I understand you um, that you feel like the staff need direction from the board relating to re having the meeting that was interrupted for the Lake Audubon renaming? Because it has been quite a while <clears throat> since that occurred. Can you speak? Okay. Yeah, yes, sorry. Mm -hmm. I was asking about the Lake Autobahn. Oh, now I can hear myself. I was asking about the Lake Autobahn renaming, um, just following up with John, and I wanted clarification. Do you need direction from the board to redo that meeting since it was interrupted? Um, no, we were, well, we were actually trying to fit it in through the Bach process for where it would fit, just with all the other priorities that came along with things like listening sessions that just were decided not to do. So, I mean, I think pursuant to our, our new process where there is no Bach and the president and the CEO will look at the agenda <laughs> setting, we can do that and try and squeeze it in. But this one, when you come back to the board, this is that community meeting that was interrupted. Yeah, right. So do we, does the board need any Inter intervention or can staff just find some time on a calendar that would be good to schedule? For Lake Audubon? For meeting? the Lake Audubon. Sure, we, we can meeting. absolutely do that. Um, I, I, w I just want to look at the prioritization. So every time it came up, it was, well, wait, we have all these other community things that are driving. There's only so much bandwidth. So don't do that was sort of the... Right. And, and that's from a staff perspective, whatever you guys think would fit in, I think the board would be fine. I just want to make sure you're not looking for board direction on scheduling a community meeting? No. Okay. Okay, so could you come back to us in April and give us a date as to when that'll happen? How about a rough time frame? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, the next item on the agenda is we have a series of informational items. Um, but first, we have a report from the Vice President Justzak, who's going to talk to us about the first meeting of uh, the Land Use Advisory Committee. Yes, well, you all just approved a new chair and vice chair of the Land Use um, Advisory Committee. So um, they have had their first meeting, learned about the... Um, some some just housekeeping advice, you know, the resolution that we all passed to create the, the meeting, went over all the land use resolutions that we currently have, um, uh, elected a, um, a chair and vice chair, and also reviewed the uh, four SSPAs that were taking place the following, we had it right before, right? The following Monday, yeah, yeah, it was the following Monday after the meeting. Um, uh, uh, Supervisor Alcorn hosted um, that meeting um, with Fairfax County staff and went over the the four um, SSPAs, and um, we received some additional information that evening related to them. What was unclear during that meeting is really what exactly the process is going to be or the timeline for the process for the SSPAs. And so um, we're still seeking some clarification on that. We made contact with um, the developers that were involved in each of those SSPAs and invited them to come to the Land Use um, Advisory Committee. Um, we accidentally, when we adopted the schedule, adopted the uh, second Tuesday of the month and in April, the second Tuesday of the month, um, is actually the annual meeting evening. So we are now doing it the third Tuesday of the month. Um, encourage anyone from the board or certainly the community to attend those upcoming meetings. Um, and we'll see if we can get some developers to um, start attending them to go over um, their development proposals um, or amendments in, um, in more detail with us and kind of um, share some of our comments or feedback and then um, you know, the process would be to bring any of that, uh, those recommendations to the board. Um, we'll probably uh, work as a group to come up with kind of a template in which we might use to bring things back to the board so it's consistent from, from um, development project to development project. So if there's any feedback you all have um, for the Land Use Committee on what you'd like to see that format be, please feel free to share it. And in answer to a question that was, uh, Mr. Uh, Director Flashman asked me, when when we have an opportunity, we actually have the first date in May, May 14th, I think, 
the Roger Bacon representative will be joining the Land Use Committee. And when that happens, we'll be inviting, as the, per the resolution, EAC, DRB, PRAC, the others to come and listen to the presentations from the other uh, committees. Go ahead. Yeah, I think it, my experience in having looked at land use issues uh, being part of the EAC is that it was very helpful to us uh, in making uh, assessments uh, to have whatever information there might be on the proposal prior to their coming mm -hmm. to speak so that we can analyze it and take a look and see what questions might be appropriate or what critiques of the project might be appropriate. Yeah, and we'll make sure we'll make those requests of the developers and then pass that information around. Right now, if you want to, if anyone, you know, as part of your committee liaison, want to direct um, your committee members what information we do have about the SSPAs is in the land use packet from that inaugural meeting. Um, and we didn't, besides some verbal presentations at that um, Fairfax County um, sponsored meeting, we haven't gotten any additional materials. But if we do, we'll publish them in the packets and make sure we circulate them to the committee. And, and just so you know, uh, Mr. Lusk circulated the four applications to PRAC last let this morning, I guess, after the BRAC meeting last night, and I'm sure he'd be happy to send it on to EAC and DRB sure. so that you all have, but just so it's clear, right now, there's not a lot of detail. And so it's fundamentally the the application, which is the two or three pager and a map telling you where it is and a summation of what the application is. So the, the, the applicants have not been forthcoming with a lot of information, but I'm happy to have Mr. Lusk, if that's all right with you, send it on to DRB and EAC, and it's PRAC already has it. Is there some other agency or advisory committee that needs to get this? I don't think so, but any information at this point is helpful right. because we don't have any. We don't have any. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And we'll publish our packets with all of the information that we have, but we'll make sure to circulate them, but they'll be on the website, you know, for anybody who wants to, to look in the interim. Um, um, and then the... Um, that was all about the, the group. I yeah, had one more right. item. Go ahead. Have. Um, so the only other thing that we're, we have been experiencing, and I had a conversation with, with Mac about this, is um, we don't have kind of any admin support for the committee. So right now it's... Um, it's basically me putting together <laughs> the agenda. I, um, Brittany kind of taught me a little bit um, in the beginning of how to reserve rooms here and and how to to you know make the minutes. And, and Tony was helpful in reviewing and making sure I wrote minutes correctly. Um, and so it it really is a self supporting um, committee. So I I kind of expressed to Mac that I was hoping that we could get some of that basic admin support to be able to run things like a a hybrid meeting. Um, you know, from from the office here um, and online, um, just because I don't know how to run a hybrid meeting um, using the, this room and this technology. Um, so I think that my understanding is Mac was going to try to find us um, some resources. But right now, I'm all I'm all you got as far as running. Well, a right meeting. now, the only thing we can do is have an in-person meeting. So if somebody, you know, wants to observe. The, the deliberations of the committee they have to be here yeah. so it's you know we need yeah. we need the ability to run a hybrid meeting like all of our other advisory committees do yeah and i suspect the developers you know are used to kind of attending these types of meetings online as well so my 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 thought is that we'll probably get those requests even from people that are presenting to us so yeah, two other so, items. I, I have something on that. Um, so happy to talk about that. I think we ought to talk about it later when we talk about organizational priorities. Um, Did I miss something? No, no, I had two other things. Oh, okay. Um, one, we asked us, uh, Supervisor um, Alcorn the status of the Reston Town Center North master plan process. Uh, pre previously had been told that they were going to approach DRB. The county staff was going to come to DRB. They haven't done that yet. He was at a loss as to when that would happen. But I wanted people to know it isn't that DRB is not paying attention. It's that the county hasn't come to DRB. And that property is subject to our, co our, our deed. And it's subject to our covenant. And the DRB will have to approve what they do. The other thing, Mac, you, have you had a meeting on the, the text amendment yet? 
So there's a text amendment talking about, you recall we had a zoning administrator's determination that said that, um, as an example, if you wanted to add lights to a facility, we had to go through a rezoning fundamentally. And we were hoping that a text amendment might reduce the burden on the association as we renovate. Where do we stand? I think there's two components to that. One is um, gaining clarity on how we can be as efficient as possible processing capital improvement requests and different permit type typology requests. There's been a little bit of um, inconsistency in answers that we've gotten from Fairfax County. So trying to gain clarity so that we can do better budgeting and know what kind of process we need to go through. And then second from that, we have um, advanced some desire to have the county revisit portions of the PRC zoning. That's coming up at the end of their fiscal year, which is the second quarter of the calendar year. And so we're gonna be going to Fairfax County and talking about the things we want in that. And you may recall the board sent a letter I can't remember the month, but sometime last year saying, here are our general concerns. So as that comes up on their work plan, we'll be jumping into the middle of all that. Yeah, the board, the board uh, um, Supervisor Alcorn got the board to direct staff to take a look at the PRC amendment during, as part of um, the conversation, I think, during comp plan. And they, they had set it for fourth, their fiscal year fourth quarter, which is everybody else's second quarter. So we're... <laughs> this fourth quarter starts next week. So hopefully something will come along about that. But that has real impact for our ability to um, renew and refresh our facilities. So we look forward to that. Um, any Anything else on land use? Any other questions on land use? Director Dodd. Sorry, unmute. Um, I understand that uh, Supervisor Alcorn expressed a desire to expedite whatever is moving forward with Rest in Town Center West, and I certainly hope he got the message that Rest and Association would like to expedite DRB review of a proposal, which I understand is awaiting county action. So I hope that was communicated effectively to uh, Supervisor Alcorn and that he will convey it to the board. I, I think I can confirm with uh, uh, Mr. Cummins. I think he got that message. Uh, and Thank Mr. You. Cummins is not nodding up and down. So I think we're pretty Thank clear you. with that message. Um, I think our next item on the agenda is the quarterly update. Is that right? Yeah, there we go. Secretary's quarterly update. And I had a couple of items in that. Does anybody else have anything on the quarterly update while I scroll through my notes? Cluster. I just had one request, um, the April 30th drainage workshop. Um, I would love to see if we can put something in RA News on that, so, something that gets beyond the clusters because that's really an every household issue, not just a cluster issue. But um, I was excited to see we were putting it on. Okay, so we're on the secretary's quarterly update on motions that RA has done, and we'll come to the comments oh, in a minute. Oh, You're fine. Oh, I skipped one. I have some for that, too, though. Oh, good. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, sorry. Um, okay. No. Going the wrong direction. Okay, so on that, there was a motion on 7-19-21 about the environmental advisory. No. Environmental Advisory Director, isn't that the name of the ti or title? We've hired that person, so I'm thinking we can take that off the list. Um, and then I was curious, uh, when I was reading it, it reminded me that you were working on um, the big resolution project, you and Tony, and I was just curious, any anything to share that's um, useful for us to, to know frank, about? I have not done anything on it recently. Recently, okay. Okay, so still work in progress. <laughs> um, but it's almost like, wasn't it the last? It was the last board even. Um, so maybe at some time during the new board cycle, um, you guys could just give us a preview. <laughs> I knew you said it was going to take you over a year, and it, and it has, but it's been a while, so maybe some education to the new board or, or, or would be nice. Or just maybe a report. Yeah, something simple. Um... Then um, I think we can also remove, there was a motion on 10-26-23 related to the audited financials for 2022. And I think that's done and can be removed. 
Done and dusted. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> um, there is some on 11-16-2023 and 12-14-2023. Um, a lot of those were related to contracts that the board approved. And I'm feeling like once we approve a contract, it doesn't necessarily need to stay on a motion list. Maybe we can just all agree that when we approve contracts, then they don't move to this report because they kind of convolute all the work plan mm -hmm. items. Yeah. Uh, oh, and there was one on 125-24 for Welch Tennis that was also is applicable to that. Um, and then the PRC work plan was in 11-16-2023, and we approved that PRC work, or the, the PRAC work plan, and so I thought that one could come off the list. And then the final thing I just wanted to verify is I saw Colson Cluster was had multiple motions, and there um, it said that they were scheduled to come back in May. Are we still that? That's not a dismissed case. That you think that's going to come back, Kim, in May? Mr. Adams, of our covenant staff approaches. Sorry. Yes. Um, actually, we just got a contact from Colson Cluster today about them actively working with the um, complainants to submit an application. So that is moving. And as you know, Colson Cluster is affected by the RELAC items. And so they are actively working. So hopefully it won't come through um, to the board by May. Hopefully it will be resolved itself. But if not, it'll, it'll be back in May. Okay. Thank you. That's all I had. Okay. I may have some of the same of yours. Does anybody else have anything? Just a very small clerical error on the motion um, on 10-26-23. This had to do primarily with the Lake Equity Work Group. Um, it's got Director Grywatch as both a nay and an abstain um, vote. So just a clerical error there that we'll clean up. You on page five of eight? I'm on page five of eight, correct. It, right. ble it bleeds into six as well. Yep. Director Flashman? Uh, I think that can be removed since the committee has, in fact, undertaken its efforts, and there's no, le no reason to maintain it as Fair something point. that has not been moved forward. Yeah, I kind of felt the same, and then it said it was a year from now the report would come, and so that's why I didn't mention it, but I felt the same when I was reading. Anybody else? I have several. <laughs> to go through. Some of them are redundant of yours. Okay. Um, but I'll go through it on a page basis, Brittany. Okay. Uh, on page one, the 625-2020 uh, item can come out, it strikes me, because we're talking about this is the opening uh, uh, for um, the, the, the ball field. Ball field. So yeah. I think the ball field's basically done, so we can take that out. Um, then on the same page, July 19, 2021, um, it was, that's the Director of Environmental Affairs. We've hired that person, so we can take that one out. Um, on page two, 623, 2022, uh, Director Dodd made a motion uh, to inventory the staff. Um, haven't got a report back on, to inventory the, the, the RA, do, uh, culverts. Do we have an idea on, on a report back on that one? I don't. Okay. Okay. If you can get back to us on that. Uh, on that same page, page two, is a July 28, 2022. The, um, there was supposed to be um, a, a report done. I'm on the bottom of the page. And now that we have an environmental director, maybe we can add for the first for the meeting in April, not the organizational meeting, but the first meeting in April. Is it possible that we can get a video report updating that, or at some point, somebody taking a, having that individual? What's his name again? Remind me. Here's Schultz. Schultz. Yes. Yeah. It, it, I don't know if it's you know does it have to be for April? No, but should it be at one of our meetings? Have a video prepared that he's had a chance to look through that so that we can get a sense of where we are on that. That would be great. I appreciate, I see Director Lusk nodding up and down. So, I mean, strike that, Mr. Lusk nodding up and down. <laughs> Excuse um, me. Was it that the, that, that report was completed and the board, uh, forgive me for 
the wrong verbiage, but we accepted. We accepted. We the accepted report. the plan. All right. Well, and maybe it was going to be updated every other year. Right. But the idea was that we were waiting for an environmental director to put that together for us. And now that we've got one, um, I'm on page three now. There's a May 25, 2023 motion um, regarding Colson Cluster. I think we can take that, that reference off. Right? Brittany, you with me? Yes. Okay. Um, there's a 2020, on uh, page four now, there's a 2026 motion. I think you already pointed this out to accept the audit. And I think we did that, so I think that can come off. Uh, on page five now, I'm on uh, the third item down, 1026 2023, to adopt the community survey calendar. I think we've already completed that, so I think that can come out. Um, the next item, uh, we're going to complete, we've already completed that thanks to the video that uh, Mr. Lusk has arranged with Mr. Shoemaker, so I think that can come out. And then on page six of eight, um, there was the approval of several contracts in a row. Um, uh, blah, blah, blah. What do we got? An IT contract, a Riverbend Landscape, and Davy Tree Company. Uh, those contracts were approved, so I think all three of those that, those entries can come out. And then I'm on page seven now. The last item uh, to remove pickleball from Barton Hills. That's a done deal, so I think that can come out. Got it. And then on the eighth page, and the object here is to get this this down to five pages. <laughs> on the eighth page. The item, uh, uh, January uh, 25, the first item is the construction contract. And the third item is um, uh, a legal committee recommendation on Emerald Court. Those items are completed from as far as the board goes. So I think those can come out also without objection. A hearing and seeing none, so ordered. And the same with uh, Director Jeshak's comments. I think Kurt, those can come out. I didn't see any objection to taking them out, Director Petrine. Uh, may I make a suggestion for future meetings that if you have changes to make, submit them before the submit them before the meeting so that we can have a chance to update it. Um, I agree with you. A lot of a lot of this is uh, stuff that. It's done and dusted, so. Correct. So, Travis, do you want us to send them to you, or do you want to? And that's why I turned on the microphone, because okay. I was just about to say that. Um, yeah, uh, prior to the meeting, in support of what Bob said, uh, forward them on to me. I'll have a monthly meeting with uh, Brittany, where we uh, go through them and make the appropriate edits. Okay. So, it, but one of the things maybe to pick forward, and I don't know if you'll continue as secretary during the next term, but, um, but. Hopefully that whoever that is is here is is some of the things you've seen us strike out like contracts sure. we don't need to do those are things that we don't need to have on this the whole idea of the quarterly update is motions that were pending where we were looking for the staff or the board to take further action at a later date so so things didn't drop through the crack that's sure. the that's the function of the quarterly update I totally understood um, however we did have a conversation about another tracking tool. Um, that we, we talked about before that would be either supplemental or would expand the on the existing secretary's uh, report. So um, that's something that uh, I want, I'm going to talk to Mac about offline and not waste the board's time with that. Certainly. Thank you. Um, next item, I think, is the cluster outreach. And I know you had a comment on cluster outreach. Uh, did anybody? I'm sorry? Megan's. Megan's on. Megan. Excuse me. Right. I mispronounce that every time. Um, so thank you for staying, Ms. McCosey. I want to let you get home. Did anybody have, uh, I know that Director Jushek had something on that. Did any other board member have anything on that? Director Jushek. I'm just going to ditto my comments from before, which was to please advertise the April 30th drainage workshop beyond the cluster uh, group. Hmm. Absolutely. Sure. 
So um, in planning this uh, workshop with communications and watershed in the Northern Virginia Soil Water Conservation District, we specifically are targeting people who have uh, members who have submitted complaints. So it's not just our clusters that are getting this communication. We're targeting specific single family homeowners, apartments. Um, we just had a meeting today with, or it was yesterday actually, with Ben about how we were going to communicate this. And so we actually shot some videos with communications. We have some Facebook things happening. And so we would encourage the board to also communicate this when we send out the flyers to you all if you want to help yeah, awesome. uh, spread the word because we do want more members to come. It's not just target, targeted to clusters, but Perfect. of course, that's where we see a lot of our concerns with drainage erosion. Yeah, no, absolutely love it. It's, it's a big issue in Raston that I think that members will absolutely appreciate having some education on. Yeah. Anything else on the... Cluster update by any board members? Director Johnson. Are we um, providing any specific or special uh, outreach to the folks who are affected by RELAC by in those efforts? By whom? I by, missed what by RELAC? Oh, RELAC. Yes. Was, we didn't I understand say, what did you I said. Completely I completely missed <laughs> 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 I hallucinated that whole situation. Um, but yeah, that was an open question. We're, we're waiting to hear whether or not they turn on the machine. I mean, as, as, as part of our outreach. Uh, our cluster outreach? outreach? Yeah. I, I don't think so. But Cam, do you have anything on that? Are you specifically talking about general outreach or as it relates to this event? As it relates to this event. Um, no, not specifically because this event, while it's it's cluster related in some aspects. What's happening with the, the clusters that are affected by RELAC, unless they are doing something that is specifically going to be an installation that's going to affect drainage, we're not specifically targeting that. So, the, so this whole issue is specifically drainage. This is not a our April 30th outreach. event is specifically drainage. I, I wasn't specifically asking about the April 30th event. I meant overall outreach to clusters but specific to the RELAC folks. But it sounds like we the, the answer to that is no. So we don't need to go further. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Johnson. All right. Uh, anything else on Cluster Connect? I think we can let Ms. McCosey go have dinner. Thank you for making yourself available, ma'am. Thank um, you. Have a great night. Have a good night. Next was the um, first quarter Parks and Rec update. That was a fulsome video. Um, one thing I want to ask about is, and I noticed this on her video, but on all of the videos, the first 30 seconds of the videos, and if Sean's listening, I hope, um, it, the audio breaks up. And so for the first 30 seconds or 45 seconds of the audio, whatever they're saying is lost on me. And I don't know, and it's true of everybody's video, but poor Laura, in her case, every time there was an edit, because you know, because it was a long video, so there, she clearly she would stop and then pick up the next section. And every time she picked up the new section, her audio got garbled for like 30, 45 seconds. I don't know why that happens, but I've noticed that it happens with all of our videos. That, that they, something goes on such that the first 30, 45 seconds I can't make out what they're saying. And I don't know if, if there's a way to fix that, but if we could fix it, that would be good. It's a Dropbox issue, just so you know, because if I download those videos and then open them, I don't experience the issues. Okay, yes, because when we export them and we play them back to listen to them to make sure there's no in issues, um, we don't get that feedback. But on occasion, um, we've communicated with our communications team that they also have noticed something like that. They're not exactly sure to pinpoint where it's coming from, but we've been working with our, um, uh, with Sean Barami on, on some of that. So um, we're looking for a solution. We don't, we don't have one at this moment, but hopefully we'll find one. Well, one of the things might be just to be dead air for 45 seconds until whatever's going on get, clears itself. Mm -hmm. I, I, do, I just don't know. It's just... Or we as board members can just download the video, then play it, and I, then I was thinking more along the lines of when we're in executive session, 
and that oh, we on play mine, that, you hear it we, too. Okay. And we play that, and so I, I'm I'm okay. I'm as concerned about that, that as as I am about board members. We can soldier through it, but Got it. the general membership something. doesn't. Um, are there any questions? Uh, Director Grouch. Not a question, just two comments. Um, Can you pull the, the microphone closer, yep. sir? So the first thing I wanted to talk through was just congratulating staff on the extravaganza that happened today from what I had heard. Um, my daughter attended the, the early morning session. From what I had heard, that went really well, and she was really excited and brought home a bag full of eggs and goodies and stuff like that. So I think those type of events, uh, especially the ones that we run at the Nature Center, uh, are awesome for the community. I think it was sold out weeks and weeks and weeks in advance, um, which is great. And um, so just wanted to congratulate the, the staff on that. Uh, the second thing um, was just a, a note. I know this board, uh, through the budget process, uh, included um, recreational facility passes into the budget and into the assessment. Uh, as a result of that, what we are seeing right now is a 2,000 pass increase from this time last year uh, with members going ahead and getting their passes early and, um, and having that ability to go use our facilities with, uh, with minimal barriers to entry. So that is great to see. Hope, hopefully that number continues to rise and grow and uh, this will be hopefully the first year in a, in a little while where we've had all 15 pools open to our membership. So that'll be another opportunity with, with passes in hand and pools open for our, uh, for our membership to be able to utilize the facilities that they pay for. So, Exceptionally well said. I'm um, going to ask a question now, putting you on the spot. I got my pool passes. <laughs> no. no? I still got to work on mine. Yep. Kara? Okay. <laughs> Good. Everybody go get your pool pass. It doesn't cost you anything. Let's make that happen. Um, but I am getting, just so everybody knows, I have had five people walk up to me in the grocery store and thank me, like I had anything to do with it, for that. And so thank you, Director Cummins, uh, CEO Cummins, and thank you to the board. This is being exceptionally well received out in the community. So we've done good, folks. Um, okay. First, I screwed up. I intended to say, Director Petrine, I know this is your last meeting as a director and last meeting as a treasurer. Yeah, 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 stop it. <laughs> Before we go to your report, I'd like to give you a couple of minutes to wax pro, 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 poetic. Um, it's, I was sitting thinking about this over the last week and um, it's hard to believe it's been four years. Most of the time. <laughs> um, it, uh, it's been a, to me, it's been a very valuable experience um, being involved in the community in which I've lived almost 50 years now. Um, and I think uh, we, uh, we do a, a good job. We now have, I believe, an excellent staff in place, a team, senior leadership team in place that will make it even better in the year, in the coming years, because we're going to face uh, a great deal, a greater number of challenges than ever before because of the age of our amenities. Uh, a lot of questions are going to come up. Um, and I think we have in place uh, the ability to, to deal with those head, head on. So kudos to the staff. This, um, it's really been uh, a great joy to work with you all. Um, so that's, that's where I'll leave it. Well, we really appreciate your four years, Bob, and I don't know that we could have gotten to the place we're at without your service to the community for the last four years. And I'm given to understand that we aren't done with you, that apparently an application has been received for membership on the Finance Committee. So we'll have a chance to torture you for, for a longer period going forward. And I thank you, you know, you've been on it, you've been on Finance Committee for four years and you still want to be on it? I don't know, I think that, that constitutes uh, masochism. Are there any questions? Uh, I'll let any other board member want to speak to the recent conversation, but are there any other conversations or questions about the Treasurer's report? 
If not, I have a brief presentation I'm going to run. And I'd like to say I did it, but I didn't. This is Dave Kerr's um, exercise. I think he makes some very insightful um, observations about the finances of Reston Association. And I wanted to take just a couple minutes. And number one, I found uh, by doing it in very bright colors that people <laughs> might actually pay attention to it. Um, there are basically uh, four issues that he brought up. And the first, which I thought was really interesting, was called breaking even. He said, when RE asks for members to pay their assessments, you'd like to believe those funds are being used, uh, invested in the community through programs and services. And the net margin each year, after subtracting capital spending as well as operating expenses, we're seeing some real big changes. And when he's talking about breaking even, my interpretation of that is that's where we should be. After we pay operating expenses and we cover the capital spending that, we've, that we uh, uh, have done during the year, it should be at a level of break even, plus or minus, but it shouldn't be an unreasonable number. Um, so, Bob, are you saying in this graph, the closer we are to zero, the better? The closer we are to zero, the better. Got it. That way we're not, basically, we're, we're really refining the budget process. We're getting to the point where we, we understand capital spending and projects and how they get done in a better fashion. And the, the point that, that Dave made is that you can see uh, as we as we've gone since 2016, where we were way over, uh, we're beginning to get to the break-even point, which is, is good. Um, you can go to the next one, Brittany. Yeah, there is a concerning uh, trend, and this, is, and this is not a criticism, it's just, it is an observation. Recreational expenses are growing faster than the overall expenses in the organization. Why is that? Because we don't charge commensurately with the, with the value we're, we're covering our costs. Yes, we have non-members who, who use our facilities and they pay up for that, but the majority of the use is for the members and that's as it should be. And it's now particularly important that because rec passes are built into the assessment, so it's more important than ever to monitor these trends and look for ways to manage the costs of amenities as efficiently as possible. But does that concern you, the trend? No. N not really. It's, it is, they're, they're, they're made up of two component pieces. The, the, the people costs, we can't, you can't run the camps, mm -hmm. you can't do Quite any good. of the, the uh, services without people. And they represent 70%, in some cases, 90% of the cost of providing the service. But at, we should just, we should be aware of these things as you, particularly as you put together a budget or do strategic planning. Can I comment on that too? Sure. Because I, I was thinking that it, what you had just said, that maybe we look at this type of graph when we're doing the budget, and what you're probably looking at is like the year-over-year -year trend. Is it growing substantially from year to year or so much differently than the trend that we already have going on? And then then maybe you dig into the budget at that point and say, okay, why, and is, you know, make a, a, a decision uh, on whether – that's the direction that we want to go for that year. Are we doing something special that's causing that? But then you're really affirmatively deciding um, if the, the margin trend is, is tolerable to the association. One of the advantages of using these graphs is uh, one, of our, one of the members of the Finance Committee, Lisa Turkletaub, always makes the point, don't use a lot of numbers. Try to make it as graphic, graphical as you can, 
and make it understandable. And I think these simple graphs show the direction of expenses. Again, it is not a criticism. It's a fact that we have to deal with. Hey, Bob, I just have one comment on this. I think um, just a preview. The last probably year or so, we've had a number of conversations. I like to use the term values space. So what kinds of things are completely covered by your assessment? What kinds of things do we assume are going to be full cost recovery or then profitable? Peter and I are now using the term fee pyramid to describe sort of the foundation that's fully covered by the um, assessment on up to 100% cost recovery or profit driven. We are obviously making some decisions, for example, like Winterfest was staffed and, and totally unbudgeted altogether. So obviously from an expenditure standpoint, we spent money on things. So we're actually looking at putting together a full study session for you all and what that looks like early on in the, the calendar year so that it builds into the budget process. So if you wanna look at certain fees and say, no, 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 we're thinking about this, that ought to be more cost recovery than what we're currently thinking. That'll help shape some of this conversation and get us maybe more on the same page going into the budget itself. Did you have some more slides yeah, just to show two us? More, two more slides. Real, uh, Director real quick. Gray, should you have something? Lori, Lori's hand's raised. I know we can't see it. Lori, but... Lori uh, Director no. Dodd? Max, Max covered my point. Thank you. Okay. The third issue that Dave raised was unrestricted cash. I know we've talked a lot about this. In fact, I, I changed his... This is not a Dave term, it's my term, ad nauseum. We've talked about it forever. And we still still can't come to, uh, uh, we've come to, an, finally come to an agreement on what that means. But one issue that we have not covered, which Dave addresses in this slide, is the impact of payables on cash. We, are, we account for things on an accrual basis, and all that means is you incur an expense in December that you don't pay until December or you know January or February. And we still have the cash in hand to pay that. So what Dave has done here is to show the relationship of cash position at the year at year end to the amount of accounts payable that were owed at the same period. And as you can see in the gold line, it is upward sloping substantially. And over the period here, the seven years that we're looking at this, the, the impact of accounts payable has more than doubled. And therefore, cash, although it appears quite healthy at the end of the year, isn't as, isn't as we don't have as big a kitty, if you will, as we think we do. And one last one. So we don't can I, can we stay on track unless somebody has a question. Um, I have it on my list to work with you and, and Dave on this and just a heads up from staff because it's going to end up in your lap. I'm curious if that short term payables amount is truly operating related um, because we pay a lot of our triple RF stuff out of our operating account and then do a transfer because if it if a substantial portion of that is triple RF related, then it's then the graph might need to be edited. Um, we might be overstating, to, it. We yeah. might be overstating well, what we our payables overstating are from an operating perspective. Payables, but at the same time, we have operating cash, which really should be reclassified into triple into RF. Into triple so RF, right. So I think there's is, something to work through. But the best information we, we had. had yeah, I knew that. But I, yeah, I think that's a great graph to also look at. But maybe need, we need a couple more tweaks to it. Yeah. So Dave's... Last one. Dave's um, final comments. It, 2023 has been successful. Revenues have been met. Overall expenses were under budget and major capital projects were completed. We finally got Lake Throw done. So 2024's budget should cover all required programs and services with adequate operating cash for flexibility and capital reserves to support continued major pro project investment. I would add one thing. The board should consider, staff should consider putting together a very loose three-year forward projected budget as part, uh, as part of the strategic plan. Now, that puts more stress on staff, but I think to, it, it, can be, it can be done over the next couple of years to really make it a, 
a good planning tool and a, and a measurement tool of how successful the organization is as it goes forward with its plans and what it costs to get you there. Thank you for, thank you for that. And I'm finished. You're welcome. Unless there are any questions. Hearing and seeing none, we'll move on to, we're gonna do lessons learned. This is yours, Director Johnson. <laughs> lessons, the lessons learned video. Um, uh, are there any questions regarding the lessons learned video? We find that that was the only way we could get it done, was to record it. Which was an excellent idea, by the way, Mr. Yes. Les. Director Garwich. So the one question I had was permitting seemed to be a bit of a wild card, right? We, we saw permits that took anywhere from eight months to some that were ranging at two months. We considered the two to four months to be a regular range, the eight months to be more of an anomaly. Is there any ability for us to preemptively receive permits? This is someone who is very unfamiliar with the construction game. Is there any way for us to preemptively receive permits prior to final approvals from the board, prior to anything, and then just not exercise those permits if we decide we don't have funds, if we don't have the budget, whatever it might be. But to get all the way through the process, to shut things down, to kind of be ready for this permit and then to not receive it and then be hamstrung, it, it just seems like it's, it's, that would be very difficult for staff to predict. And so any way we could speed up that process so you're ready to go once you have board approval and you already have a permit in hand, just looking for creative ways to get around that. So um, I'm working actively on that whole concept right now. Um, just offering, having managed um, entitlements and permitting for the better part of 25 years, it should not be difficult to be efficient and predictable. So the number one thing in government is typically being consistent in applying rules so you don't have arbitrary and capriciousness going on. Um, one thing that I think we are struggling with just as an organization is that sometimes we will ask the same question and get different answers, um, ranging from two months to two years in terms of process um, and wild fluctuations in cost. So I am working with the county to try to understand why is that happening, um, particularly when you are thrust into a legislative process, um, which basically means all bets are off and now you're with the Board of Supervisors. Why would that be? Why is it ministerial, meaning like by right in one situation and legislative in a different, same request? Um, so I'm in the process, and, and we have a history because we processed enough different kinds of permit requests to, to go through that. Um, or to give, to give, it's a lessons learned exercise as much as anything so that we can do better at predicting that. Um, I think the second part would be um, for the, can we go ahead and process down at the county without board approval? That gets a little dicey. So, for example, had we gone forward and tried to gotten approvals for pickleball at Barton Hill before the board decided if you wanted to do pickleball at Barton Hill, I suspect we would have had a community reaction, you know, in that situation. So, typically, we need. Um, enough certainty from the board that you want us to move forward on something, which is typically what you see. Like, hey, we want to do this kind of project. It's going to be tennis repaving or it's going to be a, you know, a pool. Yeah, that's right. And then, and we budget accordingly. The main problem we have is the, if we want to have a CIP discussion, when do we budget for that CIP money? And there are some some rules that, that don't seem to make sense. So for example, there's a 10% a rule. So if you make a building somewhere in the PRC zoning district bigger by 10% or less than 10%, um, you that's a ministerial process. You just go through a site plan review and talk about the impacts and you know drainage or whatever. 10% applies to Comstock's 1 million square foot building in the same way it applies to Brown's Chapel concession stand. So we make Brown's Chapel concession stand, whatever that is, 42 square feet bigger. That's literally the same trigger as whatever 10% of the biggest office building you know, out there is. So there, there's some things like that that I'm working with the county on, as well as ten tennis means pickleball. Tennis does not mean pickleball. How is that applied you know, so that we can get predictability so we're not getting different answers? But, but that's something we're working through right now. One of the... Oh, go ahead. I was just... Just going to make an observation. You used to be able to walk through uh, permits at the county. Can't do that anymore. Everything is done online, online. and that at, that is so messed up. 
I would use another pejorative term, but <laughs> it will Binary get out stuff. expression. It's, it's awful. And, and everybody reports that. The other thing I, I will observe, Director Greywatch, is um, the statute gives us certain rights and expectations of the county. Um, they're supposed to re return things around in a specific period of time. They're not supposed to come up with new ideas or new questions on second, third, and fourth submission. You're supposed to be narrowing the issues, not doing this with the issues. And that contributed significantly to the extended time period that we witnessed. Um, and what was sad about that was um, the engineer that we hired was not aggressive, nor an advocate, nor an advisor to us in that regard. I would hope that we would have, because it's the civil engineering process is most of that, then the architect works the building permit. I would hope that in the future we would have uh, a civil engineer doing our work who is much more attuned to the constraints on the county government in, in areas of time turnaround and in areas of what they're allowed to say and what they're allowed to ask for, as opposed to just being a messenger and telling us, well, the county wants this, and without saying, well, are, is the county entitled to it? And so I, th I think that that advocacy piece, I'll say has been missing, at least from my observation. I mean, and, and you know, one hopes that going forward, the next time we have a major project, we'll have um, more of an advocate on the in the uh, case of our outside consultants. And I think that will have a big impact on time of permit. If you have thought on that. Um, no, I might just ask Mr. Less to weigh in. We are actually looking at um, having multiple firms on board just as a general business practice rather than just using one firm over an extended period of time. That would allow us to be more nimble and, and potentially work with different groups should we run into any issues. Sure, so we should anticipate next month having um, on-call engineering contracts for all of you to review for approval. We have done. We actually did a, a bidders conference to bring some more people in and try to get a better look at this. Um, they all lament the same issues with Fairfax County, and I, I don't want to put all of our lessons learned as being Fairfax County issues. We're doing a lot of that now, but they've all said they're trying new and different ways to get in front of plan reviewers because they only do it online. Um, so finding new and different ways and trying to learn from the last review to not make the same mistake the second time. Director Johnson. Quick question about that process. <clears throat> so you're looking at multiple um, multiple firms. Is that because you because the firm's capacity to work on multiple projects for us is limited um, for by by their size sure. or what's the so with on calls so we. Just as background, we have on-call engineers here because we don't have engineers on staff, so mm -hmm. it's something that we have to have. Um, I was of the mind, as Chris and I were working through this, that I, I think having multiple firms is good for us just to look at different projects. Some may be um, more apt to doing landscape architect type work. Some mm -hmm. might be more in the building trades. So as we were doing our bidders conference, we were really looking for varied experience so that we can have different, for lack of a better term, tools in our belt. So mm -hmm. as we're looking at our different projects, we just have options. That's cool. Thank you. And one of the other things that I know I've talked to Mr. Lusk about is, you know, there's a difference between hiring a, an engineering firm that is, shall I say, born local and having an engineering firm that is national. Sometimes you want the engineering firm that's national because they have broader experience, broader capabilities. But sometimes it's better off to have a local person who is known to the reviewer knows the process and knows where to push and when to pull back and can push on that. And I know that in the course of going through that bidders process, that's something that he took into consideration. So um, hopefully we can get better service. Uh, are there any other things on the uh, lesson learned? I did have one observation to share if no one else has anything. Um, when we talked about communication with the membership, <laughs> Uh, we left out communication with the board. And so going forward, I think it's important. One of the lessons is to keep the board informed when we have those kind of delays, because it's the board that gets asked the question out on the street. 
It's the board that gets the phone call or the person walking up to one of us at the farmer's market at uh, John Newman saying, hey, what happened? How come my pool or my playground or my ball field isn't done yet? And so I, I think that's an important part of the lessons learned. So I offer that. Anything else on lessons learned, Director Johnson? How are you happy? I'm delighted. <laughs> Thank you. Seriously, though, thank you. I, I, I know it's it's additional work, but I also know that it's valuable work in the process. So I appreciate you guys doing it. Thank Absolutely. you. Um, the next thing on our agenda would be uh, an executive um, session. I, I do note that the one other thing we have for action item other than the executive session is a budget calendar. Is there any appetite for talking about the budget calendar before we go into executive session, or would you rather go to executive session first? I, I'm good with the but I will move to move the budget calendar item M to now. Is there any objection? Second. No, I'm, I was ready to second the motion. <laughs> uh, hearing and seeing no objection, we'll move on to the budget calendar. Uh, this is yours, Mr. Cummins. It is. I'm going to pull it up here. Um, <clears throat> so as we look at this year's budget calendar, a couple things I want to start with, and I'll be brief in my remarks this evening. Um, we did... Um, what I would call lessons learned in a post-mortem on last year's budget process in a number of ways with the intent of trying to see if there were um, things we could do differently this year um, and solicited feedback from the board and the fiscal committee um, as well as our observations as staff. And those things are reflected in the, the packet and what you see here tonight. In general, um, there are a couple of things that came up as new additions that people seem to be really interested in. There was um, a little over half the board participated in a survey um, looking and giving direct feedback. There was unanimous um, comments back that the board would like to see more department operational presentations about what goes into the operating budget and understanding uh, key performance metrics and the amount of um, labor and, and service it costs to, to deliver those metrics. So we took a look at how we could accomplish that. Um, there were comments around uh, staying disciplined within the process um, and making decisions and not backtracking. That was sort of a general theme that came out, and we could talk to what that might look like. Um, and then there was uh, some discussion around just the member suggestion process, you know, and how that would work. So what I thought I might do just very quickly is walk through the process the typical process is adopt the calendar in March um, and then begin in the springtime and go through the summertime. What we did was take a look at um, uh, starting the member suggestion process as quickly as possible tomorrow. Um, what that would look like is um, online and the, the typical notification process, but one of the lessons we learned last year at the Lake Ann Farmers Market is if we go to people and have QR codes, we get a lot better feedback, and we learned that through our... Um, community survey things. So the intent would be to, uh, obviously we're not at Lake Ann until they open, you know, in later in April, but any of our facilities having QR codes um, and, then, and then getting the word out on that. That process would run generally through mid-May. Um, you'll just see generic things on the calendar that say BOD work session. That's simply the second meeting the board set up. We're identifying what those topical areas would be right now just in general because there are a number of things the board's going to want to talk about, not just budget-related things, but you'll see those on the calendar that may be utilized for, for some of the work sessions that would <clears throat> feed into the creation of, of the budget. Um, and then the, the, the steps that you see in kind of the mid-calendar that speak to, um, for example, the, the first meeting um, where I would provide a, a high-level overview, you know, of the things that are coming, um, that's a very typical process that we have used in the past. Don't imagine a whole lot of changes there. Same thing with factors influencing the budget at the fiscal committee meeting. These are things like inflationary rates, attrition rates, and more financial metrics that can affect, you know, how things fluctuate up or down. Um, you'll also notice that um, coming out of last year's budget, um, specifically referenced here where the board would provide um, as individuals what you want us to take a look at and or price out. Um, and that process running through July with the intent of having you make final decisions on what that would look like in August. 
The reason that lines up there is it coincides with the member suggestion process. The member suggestion process just has more steps. So you have multiple opportunities to filter those down. Um, you all may recall every now and then we get some that are somewhat outlandish and, and you don't want to spend much time on those. So we build um, some filtering processes in there, which include filtering and then sending to the respective committees. So if there's something that should go to PRAC to take a look at, make a recommendation on something that would go to, you know, wherever. And then they basically all loop back with the final decision making um, occurring in August. And then the fall schedule follows the normal process. So it's the CEO's responsibility to deliver a draft budget, um, identifying what it takes to operate and run RA and or any additional things that um, we're gonna try to fund. For example, the recreation passes and what that might look like. So that showed up in, in the first CEO draft last year after our discussions in May and August. And then um, the goal is to um, start from the September budget and whittle down from there. Um, so you'll see where all the ideas are being kicked around in July and August, direction given to staff. Um, I take a look at it, see what we think we can accomplish, what we can't, how it all comes together, and then whittle down so that hopefully November is a smooth meeting um, and we're adopting your budget. The, um, the public hearings, we, we got a little bit off this year. I'll just mention our intent is to use the, the September and October meetings as public hearings. We did not notice those correctly last year, so you may all recall that we had to have a, a, a pre-BOC meeting, but we'll make sure that gets handled this year. So anyways, there's a high fly overview. We gave you um, all the background in the agenda memo with some, some other variables that are coming, and then I sent around the, the board feedback. So happy to take any questions. We're looking for the board to adopt the calendar this evening. And we'll go from there. Director Greer, I thought I saw your hand up. No, 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 no sorry. Just read the just that. <laughs> um, the draft doesn't have when staff is going to deliver draft one of the budget. When sorry. I see that it's it's probably before July 17th, <laughs> but I don't know when that is. So yeah, draft one of the budget comes to the September fiscal meeting, we typically deliver it to the fiscal committee and the board at the same time, even though the board meeting is not is a week behind the fiscal meeting. So our normal fiscal packets go out on Friday, I believe for, for each draft of the budget, we typically deliver on Wednesday. So fiscal has a full week to review the budget and the board then has two weeks in one day. It's a packet publication date is what happens there. Okay, so draft one of the budget would be delivered approximately a week before fiscal? Yeah, plus or minus uh, September 11th. When is the board meeting in September? 26. 26. No, wait, no, two. two. First That's kind of what I felt like was missing too, is we yeah. have we have working sessions, and I actually was hoping that some of this budget work would be done during our working session meeting. Yeah, public hearings. And then the public hearing might be during the regular or, board meeting. Or you could do the public hearing during the yeah, first you, October you can, meeting. You can. And and you know, get 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 that out of the way. I mean, I I, I think that we're that's what we're missing here, is that we've got two meetings a month and we can tick off some of these things at the first meeting of September and October because that's supposed to be a non- action meeting and so it lends itself to you know a spitballing kind of exercise the the september to november time frame is not a spitballing time frame so we show all the study sessions for may june and july um, and august multiple meetings in august the september study session would be the 12th two weeks behind the the 26th and the budget is typically published on the 11th 11th of September? Yeah, a week before the fiscal meeting. So fiscal no, has- I understand. Yeah. So we imagined the public hearing uh, being the September full board meeting and public would comment on that. You would decide what you wanna do at that point. But is there a reason why we can't do the second board, I mean public hearing during the first meeting of October? No, you just wouldn't have another budget. No, for, no, I know. you're giving me a budget in September. You're giving us a budget in September. I'm talking having, instead of having the second public hearing at the end of October, have the second public hearing the, fir the first meeting in October. 
I, I guess the fundamental question is, do you want the public commenting on draft two or do you want them commenting on draft one again? I, I, I'm fine with them commenting on draft one again. Why? Well, but I, okay. That, I, I, take, I take it, but I just, I can't anticipate a situation where draft one and draft two are markedly different, especially from a member's point of view. But okay, I, mean, I, I, I take your point, that's fine. I was trying to get the, I was, you know, the, the public hearings are requirements for us. Mm -hmm. They still have the opportunity to make public comment in every one of our meetings. So to me, that's a formality. And, you know, if, if, in, if after draft two comes out, someone comes to that podium and wants to be heard, we're going to listen. We're going to hear them. For instance, and, and the only reason I bring that up is because this particular budget cycle, I think draft one did not include the, the additional mooring fees. Draft two did include additional mooring fees. And obviously that was a fairly heated topic, you know, that members did want to comment on and, and touch on. So if we don't, if we stay disciplined to those ideas coming earlier in the process, those, all those kind of bigger ideas getting into draft one, then I agree with you. Draft one, draft two, we shouldn't see those types of substantial changes, although we did this year. I, mean, I see the public hearing process as a formality, and it doesn't cut off member comment. So that's why I'm trying to, okay, let's get that out of the way since we have to do those two hearings. Director Josh. Um, I, I just was, I guess I was hoping we could use our work sessions as really time, that's what I felt like I heard from all all parties is that we were, like a lot of the motions that I throw, I threw even and throw every year are definitely after draft one. And they're usually not things that are related to big policy changes. But nonetheless, I usually have at least, at least a half a dozen, if not a dozen, you know, edits to line items in, in the budget that I think that we should be considering. So I was hoping to have some more of that during our during a discussion because I feel like I, I study the budget and so when I throw out motions, I feel like people are uncomfortable with those motions because they're not as close to the numbers as I usually am. And I was hoping to have that time to be able to confer with other board members and really have a discussion of why... I'm proposing a motion. So what's the issue here? So I, but but we're not doing anything during that first half of the months of each, meeting, month. of each month's meet, yeah. meetings, and I think that that yes. is something I'd like to see built into the the budget calendar. I think just in response to that, in order to accomplish that, we would have to move all the fiscal meetings around, or assume that anything you discuss won't be ready for fiscal. And I don't know that that is what your intent would be because you'd have a meeting and we'd already have published a budget for fiscal, go to fiscal, then come back to the board. You'd be off cycle in terms of giving direction to the staff to make sure we're ready for the next fiscal meeting. Uh, although um, the fiscal committee hasn't finalized it, they've, they are looking at realigning the timing of the meeting so that it's, it's more productive uh, because the working session being at the beginning of the month, having a fis fiscal committee meeting after a working session is backwards. Right. It should be. Yeah. Uh, it would be. It would be better if fiscal was at the end of the preceding month, so it could. It could uh, better right. accomplish and uh, assimilate any changes or discussions, but it had, that hasn't been finalized yet. So um, I don't think fiscal is is going to fight the board over. In fact, I'm sure they're not, but um, they haven't. You know, they haven't come to terms with it yet. Can I just ask a question on that, Bob? So I mean, the the way the schedule lays out now, the board meetings are on the fourth Thursday of the month. And then board gives direction, and then we have to go manipulate the budget in some way, right? That 
that does take us some time to make sure that we, A, got it all right. Sometimes we have to go back and review the tapes, and everyone has seen that. So, And then we do that. We have to then run the budget, QC it, and then get it back to fiscal. Fiscal meets on the third Wednesday, which is typically like the 15th, 16th, just because of the way the days go. So when you go from the 26th of one month, the 15th of another month, and it takes 10 to 12 days, let's say, all in, including the weekends, to put it together, that's actually pretty close to because you got to pack it published for fiscal. I just I don't know if we could go from fourth Thursday to like first whenever to and be back with fiscal from with a new budget to look at. Well, maybe because it sorry may, maybe you said that it would the budget would be ready the draft one budget would be ready around September the 11th, <laughs> but we have a board meeting on the 12th. So maybe what we do is add in September 12th as kind of a presentation, like our first flavor um, from, from you to the board as a way to really get our arms wrapped around what, you, what the budget is and some discussion. And then by the time we get back on the 26th, we've had time to really review it. The meeting you're talking about, that's the working session. Right, the working session that's board meeting. Board. Yes, the working session board meeting. Is is that okay? Yeah, so the first the first one in September doesn't cause any issues at all. If the board would like to set aside time at that first session for a presentation from us, here's what the budget shows. We're giving it to fiscal, you know, next week. That one doesn't cause any issues at all. It's the rhythm after that that causes the problem. So sure, absolutely, if you want that. So then I, I would ask whoever motions for the calendar after we get through all of it that we add September, September 12th as a first budget presentation. presentation. Yeah. The, the only caveat to that is that uh, we may have it for you that day. So if you just go back to August 21st or so when you're making decisions on what you really want us to try to put in, that's when we decide, like, hey, we're really going to put the rec passes in or, you know, those sorts of things. It does take us a while to build that first budget. So, like, we usually publish a packet, like, a full week in advance of whatever <laughs> meeting you have. It may come in like that Monday for that Thursday, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. But, yes. It's a working session. It's yeah. a presentation. Okay. Right. Yeah. But you're saying for October, we couldn't do it for, like, draft two of the budget during our work session? No, I don't think that. It, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't line up with the rhythm with fiscal. Okay. Yeah. Well, then, get prepared for motions, guys, because I'll still, I'll still send them out at the end of October. <laughs> Thank and, you. And that's what I was hoping to avoid. avoid. I know. That's but why I was I trying to work it through it. It looks like we don't have a choice here. Um, Anybody else have questions? Because I, I had a couple of thoughts. Go ahead, just, Dr. Gravich. Yeah, just follow up on, on, on Jennifer's point. <clears throat> so I guess you're saying, like, there will, after hearing it initially on the 12th, then having the opportunity to present those updated motions on the, 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 the next, the fourth Thursday of that month, which is the 26th. You then believe you will still have an additional list of motions for the draft two. Yeah, because staff is there are there's still moving numbers between September and October, right? There's a lot of moving numbers, especially related to staff. We don't get updates, updated quotes on things. They're making estimates in September, and then they're starting to get real quotes to add to October. And then as we make changes, we have to edit those those line items. That's why I'm saying a lot of my motions are not really related to like new projects. They're actually related to the, the budget number per line item that is in is making changes along the way because of estimates that we're receiving closer as, as we get closer to adopting a budget. So it would not, there's no, would there be any way to alleviate that? Like if, if there was four drafts instead of three drafts and we moved up a draft, mm -hmm. draft one a month earlier, not saying it can be done, but just as a suggestion, so that those types of second round motions came in September rather than October, is that a possibility, or you're saying no yeah. matter what, you wouldn't have that clarity in their numbers until October? So expect those motions to come regardless of what the calendar says anyway. 
And if we look well, at then, the history we talk about to maybe three drafts, I mean, Bob, we've had six drafts. Of, I mean, sometimes what has happened is so many things come at fiscal as edits that staff just goes ahead and, and adopts them as, as additional drafts, even without true board approval because they're literally just so obvious that they should be updated. And that's what we have it, what we didn't see last year, which to be honest, added to the number of motions that I threw because they weren't making updates um, because they, my understanding is that um, staff felt like they needed board ad approval on that. And so even though fiscal had said, yes, we should update them and, and staff was in agreement, they didn't feel like those should be updated until the board adopted those. So I had to bring all of those motions to a board meeting instead of fiscal making some recommendations, staff making some changes, and then adding another version of the budget. Sure. So it, it really depends upon how much you all think that the board has to motion every budget change line item. And last year, that's what we did. We, but we, I had a motion every line item change. Can I potentially make a small recommendation then? In between October 24th and November 13th, would it be possible if we did a special session to get those last remaining? What I'm trying to avoid is you not seeing your updated draft two motions until November 13th, which is a mm -hmm. week before the final draft right. is due. Then we're working on the 21st before Thanksgiving, which we did. And, and then we yeah. had to come back again, Agreed. right? So how can we, potentially we insert a special budget only last motion opportunity basically in between the 24th and the 13th well, and we do have we have a regular scheduled meeting between the 24th and the 13th. But probably. it's probably right next to fiscal, isn't it? So it has no opportunity for those motions to like have any See you later day. There's nothing there's nothing for staff to do. She would make them. Fiscal would see nothing changed. And then we which still then director Jones. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Were you done? I will be making a motion for that. People can second it if they want. But yeah, let's look at when the November meeting yeah. is. Yeah, I'd actually be very scroll down. Go ahead. Um, Thank yeah, you. I'm sorry. I no worries. Um, in line with what uh, Trevor's saying, you know, I don't think any of us mind the uh, the the motions um, as a practical matter. It's just I think the process that we have to work on to you know make it more streamlined and more efficient, um, and I think that's. I don't know that we need to work that out now. That that, no. that is necessarily a board calendar issue so much as uh, we're going to get these drafts. What's the, what's the mechanism by which we'll communicate the um, motions ahead of time, and so everyone gets the because because I I think the concern with with the motions is that everyone wants the chance to understand them and kind of noodle them before we make decisions. And in this case, maybe we can create a process by which we can do that prior to. The, the issue, I think, mm -hmm. is that this, you can correct me if I misunderstand this, sir, um, that that there's an expectation that we're going to adopt this calendar mm -hmm. tonight. Was there? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think I might just offer a perspective. I think. If I was to characterize, I might characterize it slightly different than Jennifer. There are some moving targets for sure, particularly in benefits costs, you know, in some of the, the human capital part. The CIP has been a moving target a little bit in the past. We are trying as best we can to build that in a much more deliberate way. So a reserve study done by this date, you'll notice in the calendar there are actual study sessions dedicated to just the CIP so that that does not become a moving target. I think many of the things that have come up if they're all addressed and dealt with in August, the number of variables that caused wild fluctuations up and down, it goes way down in terms of what we're describing as number of motions. That's my perspective. The other feedback we got was um, the graphics that many of the board members thought were most helpful were simple spreadsheets that were like if then. So if you do this, so we're gonna build the goat trail, that adds whatever, two bucks the assessment. If you're gonna do this, it's minus four bucks. So. You know, if that's the level of thing that, that will help you all be able to make more 
or quicker decisions, we, no problem. So we're committing that those kinds of things will be easier to put together. I think it's the new capital ideas or the new operating ideas, if those come up in September or October that cause the significant problems at the staff line to build the budget. Because now we're talking about big swings in the assessment. Director, uh, Director Johnson, are you? One finish, thank you. Okay, Director Between, then Director Flashman. Um, <clears throat> I would recommend that uh, the board consider adopting an approach that accommodates the, the motions that Director Justchuk is, is going to offer. I know she's going to do it. Um, in a way that you pr you're provided with some flexibility so you don't have to go to the board. We're going to change this by 20 grand. That's, that's a horrific waste of your time. And, to say nothing of the board's time. <laughs> well, it, it, yes, but it it, it complicate. You know, if they have to formally present these kind of um, changes, they ought to be give, the staff ought to be given some flexibility to deal with with changes uh, that are reasonable, mm -hmm. as long as they're as the board is informed of those changes. It can you know, email chain is fine. Those are all available to the members. Get it done. What is uh, Director Flasher? I'm assuming that the, the comments that Jennifer wants to make uh, are comments on the budget it's as, as it has been presented at that point in time, not something new. Uh, and my recollection of last year, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that in addition to member suggestions, there was also an opportunity and a request to board members to make whatever suggestions they wanted early on in the in the in the process. Mm -hmm. That I don't see here. No, it is. Yeah, it's in the July one. July one. Okay, let me look. July one, and then we have an uh, end date. Uh, BOD submits its own initiatives. Right. Okay. And then we have an end date yep. sometime right in there July, at the end of July. There, there were some suggestions or submissions that were made uh, that were for preparation of things that would be presented in 2025 or for 2025's budget that would be now, are you going to carry those forward and in include those? So what we'll do when we get together in May and start the process, we'll identify all those that you said to hold over for consideration um, and bring those back to you and say, okay, what do you want to do with these? These were ideas you didn't take up in, for this year's budget. Do you want to build them in and start pricing them out, that sort of thing? Yep. And several of them are in the quarterly report. So, you know, it should be relatively easy to pick them mm -hmm. up. Uh, was there anybody else? Yeah, can I? Director Mopar yes, and then I, Director Gravich? Yes, I need a clarification. Um, by adopting, if we adopt this calendar, then we're locked in with this calendar. Does that mean that if mm -hmm. something happens that we're not able to modify this and we have to hold a special board meeting? Because I'm thinking about Jennifer's, uh, Director Jischak's suggestion about the September 12th presentation, and I, the intent is, in my opinion, is good. I think we need to see that presentation. But if we get to that point, and then obviously there will be an opportunity for you and others to ask questions and do motions, which inevitably will happen then does that mean that we're stuck? We can't really do anything? I, I'm, I'm a bit, I got confused with this. Can somebody I, help me out here? I, I don't think I would use the word stuck. I think uh, any process should fit your needs, form should help follow function. So as you want to try to figure out how to take a very big thing, what do we do for a budget? How does that affect the overall assessment and whittle it down to an actual number? The, the process is designed for idea generation early on and the board to make some decisions like we're not interested in that at all because it's going to be super expensive or it's just not something we want to pursue or whatever. And then the first draft budget, most of our draft budgets, if you actually look through the last number of years, are pretty consistent. And the fiscal committee is actually pretty good about pointing that out. Like almost everything where a lot of people cost because we want to provide certain kinds of service, it's pretty rare that we say, hey, we're going to do a brand new service line and here's the, total, you know, the cost of that. It's it's shaving or it's capital. So I think the process itself uh, lends itself well. If if you're finding when we get down, so that the, I assume a bedrock of all of this is you want feedback from the fiscal committee before you make decisions on each round of the draft 
budget. So in order to take your feedback and make sure fiscal has an opportunity to react to that, that's what drives some of the rhythm. I I would argue all but the last session, which is what I was going to propose again. So I can understand the October session. Uh, I can understand the September session. Well, so the September session that we've added, September 12th, in theory, we've considered adding, is a initial view for us to absorb draft one, get it earlier, be able to make our think about our comments, use the working session appropriately. I understand how that might not play with fiscal in October, but in order to make the 21st more of a rubber stamp and less of a meeting, my hope is that we could potentially use a November 7th date, which is our current working session for the board, mm -hmm. ahead of fiscal, so that fiscal is getting basically the last round of board <clears throat> asks or motions at that time. Now, hopefully between draft two and draft three, which is there's now, if we were to use the seventh, that would be a two week period for staff to turn around that budget. Hopefully those are um, very specifically crafted motions that are not a substantial effort on staff, but two weeks there to the seventh. The seventh is kind of our last call, if you will, as a body to then propose suggestions. Fiscal then basically gives their sign-off and approval of all the motions that have come to this point. They get to approve it on the 13th. And then the 21st, we are rubber stamping. We are not spending hours. Could, could I just correct something? Please. Because this happens regularly. Fiscal works for us. Sure. They don't approve anything. They recommend stuff. Recommend. And if fiscal says, oh, our hair's on fire, we don't want you to do it, we can say, thank you for your thoughts. We're going to do it anyway. Um, and that actually happened last year yep. because fiscal committee was not real thrilled with getting rid of the pool passes, but we did it anyway. So I, I'm just trying to modulate here to say fiscal doesn't approve the budget. They give us their thoughts. They give us the recommendations. At the end of the day, this body approves the budget. Didn't mean to be pedantic about that, but no. I, I don't. I don't want us. I don't want us to in, inadvertently cede our authority <laughs> to somebody is, else. Is that is that reasonable, Mac, yeah. Peter? Don, you know, I think. Um, I guess let me try to offer this um, because I don't want to set expectations. I mean, so normally your expectation is you want to have enough time to review <clears throat> something. And if it's something as significant as this is the final budget and you're anticipating sort of a speak now kind of thing. Sure. We're going from October 24th to November 7th. That's a total of two weeks. I am certain in the two years I have been here, it takes the better part of at least a week or 10 days between the budget. But again, that's predicated on a number of motions and we have to fig go back and review tapes and all sorts of things to make sure we got it all right. Then we have to build the budget, then we have to have everybody look at it, make sure it's right, uh, which means you're not seeing it until right before that meeting. Now, if at that meeting, the intent is for you to want to change at the work session and give direction to us, we won't be able to build a new budget and send it to fiscal the next day to be ready for the 13th. Understand that. Um... I can only speak for myself. I would, given that we would approach the working session, hopefully as that, I, I don't want to call it a working session because at draft three, we shouldn't really be working through too much more at that point. But like, it is a working session. If I personally do not have as much time um, to review it, I hope we could use that session to be, you know, to walk through it as a group, right? And to go take our time to use that session for the budget specifically and work through it um, and answer any last questions that folks might have. Again, to your point though, I do see the problem with the turnaround so that fiscal has enough time to review. Um, I, don't, I don't have an answer for that. Director Dodd wanted to be heard from. I just wanted to say that I there was concern about whether the voting on a schedule tonight locks us in. And the answer is it does not. I mean, we can always decide to depart from this calendar, but it gives us a very good roadmap of our planning process. And um, I think this will uh, facilitate a much better process in the coming year than we have experienced in the past. 
So I would encourage that we do take a vote on this tonight. I, I like the serious discussion of modifications, uh, but I do think it makes sense to have this kind of roadmap adopted. Director Jeff Sheck, I'll recognize you in a moment. The, the chair had, uh, had a couple of thoughts on this. One of them came from last night's PRAC meeting, Director Grawich. Yep. Um, nowhere here do we talk about when we expect committee suggestions to be received. And I'm, we're going to have committees review member suggestions, got that. But last night, you know, we had a specific one from PRAC and the chairman of PRAC threw And we said, hey, if you got it, throw it in. And the chairman of PRAC threw it in. But I can imagine that PRAC might have some, uh, EAC might have some. Uh, the, it seems to me we need to let the committees know hey, if you have suggestions, give it to us by a date. I don't know what that date is. Um, the board is has until July 1. You know, I, 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 I don't know if we want to tell them July 1. I think, I don't know, tell me, somebody tell me that's crazy. Um, that's, that's item number one. Item number two is the May 15th cutoff for the membership. Um, that's fully six months before we adopt a budget. And, and the thing of it is, is it's before the pool's open and the play fields have barely gotten started as far as activity goes. So we're saying to the membership, and, and we're not even going to act on their suggestions until far later in the exercise. I, I just get concerned that if we're a member-focused organization or a member-facing organization, tell them, hey, if you don't get it in by May 15th, well, better, not, better luck next year. Um, I just, it just feels like we're excluding them because it's so early in the cycle, six months before we adopt a budget. And I, I, does it really need to be that early? Um, I think it's a, a value discussion for you all. So let's assume you push it back to somewhere in the middle of June or July 1st. The, uh, if you want to have your committees, if you want to have a filtering process, so you're not just sending all of them to the committees or something, um, and you want to be able to have that conversation, normally you have that conversation at the joint fiscal uh, board work session, which is shown as May 30th, so that you can then filter and send those things off to the committees for input and have the committee send them back to you with thoughts. So if you skip that meeting, um, you could send them to them later. Um, you would just potentially have a lot more still in the hopper, which causes you know additional work. I thought so, we did that last year in August. You made the decision in August. We referenced them to the committees and they came back at the August meeting. Okay, but if that's where, when we wanna make a go, no go, do we really need to have a cutoff in May? The members come in at May. Uh, the way it's shown right now, the member suggestion cutoff is in May. The joint board fiscal meeting two weeks, so we would put together some order of magnitude. Like last year there was one, let's do an overpass on Baron Cameron. We said that's millions, right? Then there was, hey, here's this other idea, and it's a, it's a couple thousand dollars. So we give you an order of magnitude in May. You say, okay, we're cutting these five out of the 35, and the rest distribute to the committees. We give them to the committees in June, and then they loop back is what happens. And a lot of those committees need time to look at them over the course of their meeting. So from kind of mid-June to mid-July so that we can then keep moving forward. That's how it's currently set up. I understand that. I just, I, my experience last year was there were, the go trail is, my, is what I'm thinking about. And it was like, wait a minute, this is a good idea. And it's, we haven't even thought about it. And I, I had to make a motion to get that back into the budget in October or September, sometime later. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it just strikes me as that we're, we're uh, I made my point. Director Justin. I motion to approve the 2024-2025 draft budget development timeline as presented by staff with the following additions. Add to July 1st, so that it reads uh, board of director, committee suggestions, and any final member suggestions. That's our deadline for that. Uh, September 11th, staff delivers budget files to 
everybody, the board, fiscal, and the members. September 12th, uh, budget presentation by staff to the board of directors with fiscal committee invited. And add on November the 7th, a board of director budget discussion and action as part of the regularly scheduled <coughs> work session for the board. Seconds. Yep. I heard the motion and the second discussion. Do you want me to read them one more time? Just the last three. The last three. So I'm just, what I'm doing is, is adding, I'm leaving the member suggestion form open, which we have done every year for years. So you can, ha you, we, we give them an initial date and then some things can come in after. I'm adding the ability on July 1st for committees, the board and members all to kind of have all their final suggestions in. On September the 11th is just adding that draft one is coming to us because it's the first draft. On September the 12th is our normal board work session. So that will be a budget presentation by staff. And because it's the first, I would ask that fiscal committee members be invited um, to, to view that with us since they'll be looking at it the next week. And then adding in that on November 7th, which is our normal work session, um, that we may take action at that meeting to do any you know, final budget tweaks so that when we do get to the second meeting of that month, hopefully we have final numbers. Is that, and I can get you one, is that? No, that's good, I got it. Thank you. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing and seeing none, all those in favor will say aye. 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 Director aye. Perry, you said aye. That is the animus yeah. of all those present and voting. Just one thing from an expectation standpoint. So on July 11th, we were showing BOD determines member requests that should be advanced for further pricing. That will obviously not be happening now because member suggestions will go through July 1st. We also showed that uh, the board would be delivering member suggestions to committees for review in June. Obviously, that will not be happening because the member suggestions now aren't due Till July. So when we get to July, we just need to talk to you all about what you want to price out. It seems to me, no, no, Mr. No, no. Com it seems to me, Mr. Cummins, what, we're, what should be happening is to the extent that we have member suggestions uh, uh, previous to July 1, that those member suggestions should be reviewed by the board with us telling you which ones to go forward with. All we're saying is that we're leaving open the possibility that if there is something that comes in between what am I looking at? May 30th and July 1st, so something that comes in during the month of June, that the board would take, would look at that suggestion. But anything that comes in before then, it would seem to me would be something that we would look at as soon, in an appropriate time to look at it. So it's not that, we're not saying we don't want to look at anything before that date, we're just saying it's a safety valve so that if a member comes in with an idea in June, that we're going to look at it. We're not going to tell them that, oh, too late. That's, that's what the motion accomplished. And then after July 1, it's all Yeah, basically yeah. after that's July 1, it's like, see ya. Mm -hmm. Is that clear? A little bit. Just want to make sure I'm super clear on this. So we're going to do this in waves this year. So the first round will be sent to committees to review. Mm -hmm. The latter round will not because we'll get to July and the committees will already be delivering back the first round it, to you. It, it, and the board will be, decide what to do with It may be that those. we get a suggestion. First of all, it may be that we get nothing in June, okay? It may also be that we get something in June that we want to send out to a committee. Okay, we can do that. We're, you know, and we then we would say to the committee, get back to us on a specific date and we'd figure it out. <clears throat> so I, I, I think we're trying to, I think the, that's the graph of the motion. I don't think I need to. Do a whole lot more. Anything, we've adopted the budget yep. timeline. Is there anything more on the budget timeline since yes. we've already adopted it? Yes. Director Flash. I'd like to request that uh, staff produce for us a revised, the, the, the version of the budget timeline mm -hmm. as revised so that we can have that and share it with others. Okay. And so that would be appropriate to be done sometime next week. Okay. We will make sure this is done like in the next couple days. I'm sorry? We'll get it done in the next couple days and send it out to everybody implementing the changes you've asked for. Thank you. 
Okay. So I move. We're done with that session, right? We're done with okay. that item. Move to convene into executive session to discuss contractual personnel and consultation with council. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor will say aye. 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 Director Perry. I don't see Director Perry. No, she's there. She's there. No, Director Perry, you, how do you vote? On executive session, ma'am? She mute? No. Yeah. Okay. We'll go with that. Stepped away from Epstein. I will list her as abstaining. All right. Thank you. Hello, this is Chris Shoemaker, Director of Capper Projects. I'm going to give you a brief presentation on the lessons learned. Hello, this is Chris Shoemaker, Director of Capper Projects. I'm going to give you a brief presentation on the lessons learned at Lake Throw and Shadowwood Pool Projects. Throughout the course of both projects, staff have identified four areas of review that will fall into a category of lessons learned. These categories include communications, pre-construction and site evaluation, project timing and scheduling, and Fairfax County timelines. Project communications to the Board of Directors and RM membership has been identified as one lesson learned from the Lake Throw and Shadowwood Pool projects. Lake Throw was originally planned to start in April 2022 and be completed 12 months later in April 2023. However, Lake Throw will not reopen until the 2024 swim season. The Shadowwood project was originally planned to start in May of 2023 and be completed prior to the end of the 2023 swim season. However, it too will reopen for the 2024 swim season. Staff have identified that clear and frequent communication to the public regarding project timelines are a lesson learned from both projects. The Capital Department and Communications Department now hold regular meetings to discuss project progress and communications with the membership. Pre-construction and site evaluation has been identified as another lesson learned through the Lake Throw and Shadowwood projects. Multiple site issues caused delays at Lake Throw, including framing rot in the bathhouse, poor soils not discovered in the geotechnical study, and inaccuracies in the as-built drawings. At Shadowwood, severe damage was discovered on 80% of the pool beam and basin, causing project delays. Staff have identified that for major projects, destructive testing and confirmation of as-built drawings via site surveys and test digging are appropriate in an effort to avoid these issues encountered at Lake Throne Shadowwood in the future. Project timing and scheduling have been identified as another lesson learned through the Lake Throw and Shadowwood projects. Lake Throw was slated to begin in April of 2022, but did not start until August due to permitting delays. Shadowwood was anticipated to be four months, but when severe beam damage and shell damage was discovered, it pushed its completion outside the swim season. The project was also planned in phases, which extended the schedule of the project. When developing project schedules, staff will try to anticipate site, permitting, and other associated factors that may cause project delays, and by doing so, staff can more clearly and accurately communicate anticipated project timelines to the membership. Staff will also move away from project phasing when appropriate to avoid confusion and communications to the membership. The next lesson learned is the Fairfax County permitting process. For Lake Throw, the county permitting process took significantly longer than anticipated, going from four months to nearly eight months. As part of the review process, several design changes were mandated that had triggered multiple modifications to the scope of work. Shadowwood permitting took two months, which was generally aligned with expectations. When preparing for permit submissions, staff will account for additional time for permitting. Staff will also onboard contractors once the first round of comments are received to avoid unexpected scope modifications that can cause additional costs as well as delays. Now for some conclusions and key takeaways. Staff will move away from project phasing where appropriate in order to avoid confusion amongst membership communications. Staff will build time for permitting and site issues into project schedules. 
For major projects, staffs will include tasks like destructive testing and advanced site evaluation prior to engaging in project scheduling. As part of site evaluation, as-built drawings will be confirmed and tested prior to construction. Clear and frequent communications to the public regarding project timelines will be included. And the Capital Department and Communications Department will hold regular meetings to discuss project progress and communications to the membership. Thank you. this evening and I hope you enjoy the update on the Recreation Services, Environmental Education and Member Services Spring Update. My name is Laura Kowalski. I'm the Director of Recreation, Environmental Education and Member Services and I look forward to sharing this information with you. Update includes a look at who's recreating with Reston Association through demographics, a recreation past sales update, the Recreation Department updates for the first quarter and then a look ahead to what's coming in the second quarter, a thank you to the Friends of Reston, and information on the Community Survey Implementation Plan. This is a glimpse into the 2024 demographics from January through March 15th on who is participating in Reston Association Recreation. As you can see, 80% of the participants come from a zip code in Reston, with the highest percentage in the South Lakes and Hunterswoods Dogwood districts. We've had 147 reservations across our community buildings in the Conference Center, Browns Chapel, Glade, and almost half of those have been at the Lake House. Programming has just kicked off for the spring, and registration for our camps is the most popular program type of our all ages programming is the most popular at 39%, followed by the infants and toddler programming. As we move through the year, especially with our busiest time during the summer, we will report out on, and you can watch these percentages change. For recreation passes. For members, the pass is all-inclusive with pools, tennis, and pickleball all included. For non-members, there are options for all access or just a court pass. New this year, the recreation passes for members is included in the annual assessment. Members will still need to activate the recreation pass the same way they have purchased in the past or create an account. There is no additional fee. With this change, we have seen an increase of over 2,000 passes activated from this time last year. Non-member recreation pass sales are slightly down. Aquatics Department is gearing up for summer. All 15 pools will be in operation with the exciting return of Lake Thoreau and Shadowwood pools, which have both been under renovation. The pool schedule was reviewed this first quarter for responsiveness to the recent community survey. The current schedule is 84% responsive to when members prefer to swim, and we are working to expand that as we move into the summer. The American Red Cross Lifeguard Certification Program curriculum has been updated. Our aquatics team is certifying all of our lifeguards with that most up-to-date training to maintain safety at the pools. We'll host more than 20 classes through the summer for this update. The Fairfax County Health Department will host its annual pool operator inspector training program at Reston Association Pools. This is a great example of the collaboration and partnership we have with the health department. Registration for swim lessons opens Monday, May 6th. Other programs open April 1st. Scholarships are available through our partnership with the Friends of Reston for swim lessons, lifeguard certifications, and swim instructor certification courses. Please visit our website for more information. The Reston Tennis update for this first quarter includes registration. Our Reston Team Tennis League registration began and we will host 17 teams this year. Junior and adult program registration is open for lessons beginning in April. Drop-in tennis for recreation pass holders is on Friday evenings and we onboarded our 14 tennis and pickleball instructors. 
Coming soon in the second quarter includes the renovation of our Glade Clay tennis courts. The tennis courts will see 12 USTA junior tournaments and adult leagues this year. Rest in leagues begin mid-April. And May 4th, we invite you out for a Rest in Tennis Day for the community to enjoy in partnership with the United States Tennis Association. And June 21st, we will host the Rest in Mixed Masters for those players that are at the 3.0 to 3.5 tennis tournament level. Our pickleball update for the first quarter includes registration with 72 adults participating and a handful of children. Autumnwood open play continues to be the most popular with over 150 players a day enjoying the courts. Coming soon in the second quarter, classes begin April 1st. Teen pickleball classes begin this spring and we will host a professional pickleball registry teaching certification. The Pro Shop is also open for business for shoes, paddles, and more. Rest in Camps is celebrating its 50th year anniversary. We will have a celebration on July 27th this summer. Please look out for more information. Our enrollment this year is anticipated to be over 2,000 campers, and we are currently 65% enrolled. We also have saved spots for at least 30 children through scholarship funding by the Friends of Reston. As you can see, summer looks amazing with all of the program offerings that we have listed here, from nature tots to day camp, tennis, aquatics camp, adventure camp, watercraft camp, junior lifeguarding, and counselors in training. We have a camp for all ages. We invite you to come out to one of our boat rental locations or to participate in a class this summer. Lake Am Dock and Lake Audubon Boat Ramp will be open for business on Saturday, May 25th of Memorial Day weekend for programming and rentals. Fun this summer includes a rental on your own or visiting Lake Ann during one of the festivals to experience it on the lake or maybe a private group. Organize a kayak or stand up paddleboard rental. We have lessons for any group, but also invite Girl Scouts, corporate teams, and any private event requests. Stand up paddleboard lessons and yoga will be expanded after another successful pilot program last summer. Registration opens on May 1st. Volunteer Reston has had a busy first quarter. We hosted over 75 volunteers at the MLK Day of Service projects at the Kathy Hudgens Community Center at Southgate. We've hosted a community cleanup with over a dozen Cub Scouts and their parents on March 16th. Volunteers picked up litter at Dogwood Elementary School along Glade Drive and RA Paths. And we hosted a Habitat Heroes on March 23rd at Walter Point Lane Natural Areas. Coming soon in the second quarter, proves to be just as busy as the first. We will participate in a Founders Day cleanup at Lake Gam Plaza from 10 to 11. Reston's Arbor Day will be held at Polo Club Recreation Area, and the Walker Nature Center's Earth Day will see volunteers from Volunteer Reston. We look forward to April 27th for our Potomac River Watershed Cleanup at Hunterswood Shopping Center and the Community Yard Sale and of course our Spring Festival at the Walker Nature Center May 4th from 1 to 5. If you're interested in volunteering, please visit our website. We would love to have you join us. This first quarter, the Walker Nature Center hosted the Principles of Interpretive Planning Workshop. This was in coordination with the National Association for Interpretation. Our own staff were in attendance along with other interpreters and managers from several different agencies. It was a great training and we gained some valuable insight from our peers. We now have an automatic door opener at the front door at the Nature House. 
The electric vehicle charger was installed and is being tested with rest and association vehicles to develop a standard operating procedure and expansion for RA members. Coming soon in the second quarter is our spring native plant sale. Orders are due April 5th and pick up April 20th. We also will host Reston's Arbor Day and March 28th we will have an extravaganza event. We will see May 4th for our Spring Festival, and we'll have Earth Day activities, bird walks, programs for all ages, and look forward to our environmental short film series throughout the year. A very special thank you from Reston Association to the Friends of Reston, our 501c3, for their continued support for Reston Association members. So far this year, the following programs have been issued as a fundraising activity for this group. Youth scholarships for youth programming to include swimming, camp, tennis, pickleball, and nature. The return of Reston Association's Adopt-A-Bench program and funding for the new electric vehicle station at the Walker Nature Education Center. If you're interested in donating, please visit and donate today at friendsofreston.org. Our Community Events Department had a successful first quarter with trips to the National Harbor's Titanic exhibit, a visit to Capitol One Hall for the Share Show, and a visit to the National Theater for the Book of Mormon. There was a jigsaw puzzle event and we saw the wonderful return of our beloved Senior Movie Day. The second quarter continues with the fun with our community yard sale, tea and painting activity, grand reopenings at facilities, movies in the park, dive-in movies, dog paddles, our totally trucks in its 24th year, family picnics, national night out, our end of season pool party, and trips to the Nationals baseball game, sheer madness at the Kennedy Center, and more. These next slides include an update for the action steps for the implementation of the 2023 Community Survey conducted last summer. The biggest initiative last summer was the Community Survey. The survey was open for members to provide input into the development of Reston Association's next 10-year facility plan. We saw over 1,700 responses, surpassing the turnout in past surveys. The results are posted on the Reston Association website and updates will be provided to the public quarterly on progress. This executive summary provides insights to the key findings by RA members who have indicated they greatly value pathways and pools and would like to keep and maintain existing facilities open, but with expanded hours, especially pools. One of the key findings is that members who use Reston Association's Parks and Recreation facilities are most satisfied with RA and the related value of their assessment. A staff action is that staff will conduct a review of operating hours for all recreation facilities to ensure responsiveness to the survey where possible. This will be completed in the first quarter of this year. As you can see with the action steps, this is well underway. In January, staff completed a review of the community survey section on hours of operation and use. We developed a process for reviewing the current schedule to compare it to community survey findings and preferred times that members would like to use the facilities and finalize the opportunities for responsiveness in a report. This March, we are working with Reston Association departments and external organizations on a schedule change. Working with the communications department on edits and marketing for the new schedule for the website, print, and social media material. This April, we will present the findings to the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee through an information session. We will post the rest on the Reston Association website and promote to the recreation pass holders through a variety of tactics. For the development of the pool schedule for 2024, 
we will have Lake Thoreau and Shadowwood pools open after being closed for renovation. There will also be an additional 400 hours added based on the community survey results. The schedule for this season will be released on the website on April 1st. The next key finding update is that members are far more interested in maintaining and in some cases expanding usage opportunities for our current parks and recreation facilities than they are in investing new facilities. The staff action related to this is to review the existing capital improvement plan to ensure facility maintenance projects are planned for recreation facilities. As you can see in the action steps, Staff have reviewed the existing capital plan and identified projects that support the results of the community survey in January. In February, we finalized and released an RFP for the 2024 reserve study. And currently, we are finalizing contracts and awarding a reserve study vendor. And then April, we will begin the work on the reserve study. Another key finding is that Reston Association pools are used by almost seven out of 10 members. They are the second most frequently used facility type besides trails, and they are widely valued. One item that staff will take action on is exploring credit card point of sale at all pool facilities. In addition, we'll explore other e-commerce opportunities. This will be an ongoing action to help support things like concession sales and other purchases at the pools. For the action steps, in February, an internal team was identified for the project. And in March, we've identified action steps for project exploration to include existing and alternative points of sale options, on-site testing at locations, evaluation of the testing sites and training process, and then provide staff training on the application, which would be identified. Then in April, we would deploy applications identified for point of sale and continue the evaluation for service. Thank you for listening. We look forward to seeing you around Reston this spring.
Hello, I'm Doug Britt with the Environmental Advisory Committee, and I'm presenting information regarding the implementation of recommendations previously made by our committee to improve or preserve environmental conditions in Reston. As background, our committee prepares the RA State of the Environment Report, known as RACER, every two years. This report assesses the status of 23 environmental attributes of our community. Based on these assessments, the committee then recommends actions that may be taken to preserve or improve conditions of these attributes and documents them in an Excel spreadsheet that is available on the RA Nature and Environmental Overview webpage. This spreadsheet, known as the RAISER Recommendations and Report Card, is updated annually to track what progress, if any, has occurred toward the implementation of these recommendations since the last two racers were issued. Progress is denoted on the spreadsheet using the following symbols and color coding. This is an example of part of a page from the current RACER recommendations in a report card showing the status of recommendations addressing air quality for the years 2022 and 2023. The following presentation presents highlights from calendar year 2023 RACER recommendations and report card. Currently, there are 98 active recommendations, including several dating back to the initial RACER publication seven years ago. But it should be understood that the vast majority of recommendations are multi-year in nature and not one and done initiatives. It's not the purpose of this presentation to describe each of these recommendations, but rather to summarize how well their implementation is progressing. Of the 98 active recommendations, 13 are new to the last racer, that is the 2022 racer, and 85 are from uh, previous racers. With regard to implementation, 44 are reasonably progressing, 30 exhibit more limited progress, and 24 show little to no progress being made. One recommendation was rescinded in 2023. It should be noted that 43 of the 98 recommendations were already being implemented by RA to some extent prior to their being listed by the committee. The committee also recognizes that some recommendations are outside the authority of Reston Association to implement and may require actions by the county or the state or from homeowners and commercial businesses to successfully implement. It's also noted that 41 of the recommendations may be implemented with the help of volunteer services and that eight are policy related and thus require board review and approval before they can be implemented. With regard to the policy related recommendations, one is to revise the design review board guidance for gutters and downspout designs to better protect downstream and neighboring properties from the effects of runoff. Another is to develop a policy compatible with the Fairfax Natural Landscaping at County Facilities Amendment for all Reston Association properties. A third is suggesting RA request Fairfax County add more purple bins in Reston for glass recycling or otherwise service them more often. Fourth is to develop and via the design review board, implement new lighting guidance to make Reston a model for environmentally sound lighting practices. Another 
is to develop a rest and climate action plan complementary to the Fairfax County's community-wide energy and climate action plan and its climate adaptation and resilience plan, taking into account Reston's unique attributes, strengths, vulnerabilities, and opportunities. Another is to consider climate change when formulating new policies or planning new projects and when purchasing or leasing new equipment. Another is to promote energy conservation practices through education and outreach initiatives, as well as through official Reston policies and procedures. And finally, to demonstrate environmental leadership by installing solar on compatible RA facilities, parking areas, and other properties to offset the energy use at other RA properties, and to promote and facilitate installation of solar technologies on residential and commercial buildings. In conclusion, the Environmental Advisory Committee requests that Reston Association continues performing all recommendations that are deemed to be reasonably progressing, and that the RA staff assess whether progress can be accelerated on the others and inform our committee to the reasons for postponing or not pursuing RA-directed recommendations so that the committee may re consider rescinding them in future report cards. And finally, we suggest using the latest published RACER as an onboarding resource for the newly hired RA Environmental Director. Thank you for your attention, and uh, this concludes our presentation. I'm Megan McCosey, Community Outreach Manager here in the Covenants Administration Department of Reston Association. Along with Cam Adams, the Director of Covenants Administration, I will be providing our first cluster outreach update of 2024. Covenants staff's outreach programming continues to be robust and impactful, with show and tell cluster and condo walking tours still serving as a highlight. Meeting with cluster and condo association leaders and stakeholders on the ground in their neighborhood to discuss observe and troubleshoot all manner of issues and concerns remains our single most effective tool for establishing or reinvigorating a lasting productive relationship between Covenant staff and sub-association leaders and members. Common considerations and topics of conversation during show and tells include cluster and condo standard maintenance, drainage and erosion, electric vehicle charging stations, and board governance best practices. As Reston is home to approximately 180 sub-associations, Covenant staff is extremely proud of our year-over-year -year increase in demand for and completion of show and tells. We've already hit the ground running in 2024 and are projecting our greatest show and tell count since we started the walking tours in 2020. Show and tells are currently being scheduled into April and May, so please contact your association's dedicated Covenant's advisor today to schedule yours. Greets also continue to be a popular offering amongst our outreach programming. These virtual content specific meetings are well attended as live events and regularly accessed afterwards as recordings via the cluster resource hub. Our last meet and greet of 2023 focused on best practices and community association compliance and enforcement was attended by approximately 30 sub association representatives. Our 2024 meet and greet calendar includes both virtual and in-person events and will cover topics such as drainage and erosion considerations, maintenance planning for association common ground, and board governance best practices, in addition to the extremely popular legal seminar tentatively scheduled for June. Looking ahead, outreach initiatives will include finalization of brand new condominium design guidelines, deployment of a new cluster standard digital library format, 
five more issues of the Cluster Connect newsletter after the first of year issue was published earlier this month, and continued maintenance and distribution of the Cluster and Condo Association directory, which can be accessed as a top menu item under the Property Owner Resources dropdown of Reston.org. Finally, be sure to mark your calendars for our highly anticipated Drainage 101 workshop, a hybrid event taking place on April 30th at 6 p.m., live at Reston Association headquarters and virtually via Zoom teleconferencing. Conducted in partnership with RA's Watershed Team and Fairfax County's Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District staff, this event will be designed specifically to equip homeowners and cluster association leaders to best tackle drainage and erosion considerations and challenges on their property and within their neighborhoods. Expert speakers will guide participants through a range of topics, including identifying common drainage and erosion problems, assessing their impact on landscapes, and exploring sustainable solutions. We hope to see you on the 30th. Covenant staff looks forward to hearing from you and continuing to serve Reston Association's membership. Please contact us directly with questions and comments. Take care and enjoy your evening. Good evening, everyone. This month's Treasurer's Report will focus on the financial results for 2023. I intend to provide you with some context for this year's results rather than to assault you with the numbers. But if you are interested, you may find more of the detail of the results in the meeting package that you can find in the Association's Dropbox for the March Board of Directors meeting. Financials remain strong. Revenues exceed budget and prior year by $1.5 million. Expenses came in under budget, but total operating costs increased on a year-over-year -year basis. And unrestricted cash reserves declined, but restricted cash reserves increased significantly. Total revenues increased by $1.5 million versus both against the 2023 budget and on a year-over-year -year basis. Assessments and fees were 241,000 better than the 2023 budget and over <clears throat> 631,000 against 2022 actuals due to increased activity in transaction fees and increases in interest and dividends earned. Recreational programs were 131,000 better than budget due to better than anticipated performance across the spectrum of all recreational programs. Central service facility generated more than $1.1 million than budgeted due to the sale of $1.27 million in wetlands credits that offset the underperformance in sponsorships and advertising sales. Finally, the proportion of revenues generated by programs and services increased by 2.7% in 2023 to 20.9% of total revenue. Expenses continue to run under budget this year by 537,000, but total operating expenses on a year-over-year -year basis increased by 1.1 million. Versus budget, a majority of the positive variance is attributed to lower people costs, 510,000 than anticipated. Given the number of senior staff hires made during the latter part of 2023 and now into 2024, this positive variance will be trimmed if not eliminated in 2024. On a year over year basis, the $1.1 million increase in expenses was driven by an increase of 798,000 in people costs, an increase of 57,000 in a variety of outside professional services, including the retention of a virtual CIO, and $283,000 increase in other expenses, including facilities repairs, computer equipment and software, and maintenance contracts. This slide highlights the spending by cost center. 
of the five centers. 34.4% 34, 34 of operating expenses are allocated to support services. Recreational services and central services account for an additional 51.1% of total operating expenses. All this should be kept in, kept in perspective because we maintain 1,300 acres of land in over 375 legal parcels, four lakes, three ponds, and four dams, boating and fishing access to the lakes, 55 miles of paved pathways, and eight miles of natural surface trails, 15 outdoor pools, 50 outdoor tennis courts, 26 lighted, eight clay courts, six 36-foot courts for eight years, eight year old and under play, four pickleball courts, 30 multi-purpose courts, a 72-acre Walker Nature Center, 16 picnic pavilions and arbors, 35 tot lots, 21 ball fields, and three community buildings, the Lake House, Brown's Chapel, and the Headquarters Building. On the balance sheet as of December 31st, unrestricted cash totaled 5.7 million, a decrease of 297,000 over December 31 of 2022. Restricted cash, composed of triple RF and CARF cash and investments, the CAT fund, cash from stream mitigation and wetlands tax credits and deferred compensation totaled 10.456 million. That is $2.5 million greater than at December 31st, 2022. This increase is primarily due to the reclassification of cash from stream mitigation and wetlands tax credits whose use is restricted by contract with the Virginia Stream Restoration Bank. Capital assets grew by 4.7 million net of accumulated depreciation as assets, both new and replacements, were acquired and or placed in service in 2023. Capital spending. At the beginning of 2023, RA had a total of restricted cash and investments of 6.8 million, 6.2 million in triple RF funds, and 590,000 in CAR funds. These restricted funds available only to replace, repair, renovate, or purchase capital assets were available to complete $7.8 million in budgeted capital projects. During 2023, a total of $4.7 million was spent with an additional $2.8 million to be spent in 2024 and beyond to complete those budgeted projects based upon costs known at the end of 2023. At the end of 2023, RE had a total of $5.9 million, $5 million in triple RF and CARP funds available to complete the budgeted projects, as well, as well as to provide for the completion of new projects to be approved in future years. In accordance with Resolution 4, RE has developed a metric to assess the adequacy of triple RF, triple RF cash and investments based on a 10-year moving average plus a 10% contingency allowance. Based upon the latest reserve study required by state statute completed in 2019, RA should have had a minimum triple RF balance of 3.67 million at the end of 2023. The actual triple RF balance at December 31, 2023 stands at 5.734 million. Overall, Reston Association's financial performance in 2023 was positive. RE continues to generate revenue adequate to cover current operating expenses and build healthy cash reserves to address current and projected capital spending. One area of note, staffing costs are expected to increase in 2024 as positions filled in prior years become fully staffed. That is my fin final financial report as treasurer. 
It has been a distinct honor to serve my community for the past four years. If you wish further details, please use the link for this meeting to access my written report. Thank you and have a great rest of your evening. Hello, this is Chris Shoemaker, Director of Capper Projects. I'm going to give you a brief presentation on the lessons learned at Lake Throw and Shadowwood Pool Projects. Throughout the course of both projects, staff have identified four areas of review that will fall into a category of lessons learned. These categories include communications, pre-construction and site evaluation, project timing and scheduling, and Fairfax County timelines. Project communications to the Board of Directors and RM membership has been identified as one lesson learned from the Lake Throw and Shadowwood Pool projects. Lake Throw was originally planned to start in April 2022 and be completed 12 months later in April 2023. However, Lake Throw will not reopen until the 2024 swim season. The Shadowwood project was originally planned to start in May of 2023 and be completed prior to the end of the 2023 swim season. However, it too will reopen for the 2024 swim season. Staff have identified that clear and frequent communication to the public regarding project timelines are a lesson learned from both projects. The Capital Department and Communications Department now hold regular meetings to discuss project progress and communications with the membership. Pre-construction and site evaluation has been identified as another lesson learned through the Lake Throw and Shadowwood projects. Multiple site issues caused delays at Lake Throw, including framing rot in the bathhouse, poor soils not discovered in the geotechnical study, and inaccuracies in the as-built drawings. At Shadowwood, severe damage was discovered on 80% of the pool beam and basin causing project delays. Staff have identified that for major projects, destructive testing and confirmation of as-built drawings via site surveys and test digging are appropriate in an effort to avoid these issues encountered at Lake Throne Shadowwood in the future. Project timing and scheduling have been identified as another lesson learned through the Lake Throne and Shadowwood projects. Lake Throw was slated to begin in April of 2022, but did not start until August due to permitting delays. Shadow was anticipated to be four months, but when severe beam damage and shell damage was discovered, it pushed its completion outside the swim season. The project was also planned in phases, which extended the schedule of the project. When developing project schedules, staff will try to anticipate site, permitting, and other associated factors that may cause project delays and by doing so, staff can more clearly and accurately communicate anticipated project timelines to the membership. Staff will also move away from project phasing when appropriate to avoid confusion in communications to the membership. The next lesson learned is the Fairfax County permitting process. For Lake Throw, the county permitting process took significantly longer than anticipated, going from four months to nearly eight months. As part of the review process, several design changes were mandated that had triggered multiple modifications to the scope of work. Shadowwood permitting took two months, which was generally aligned with expectations. When preparing for permit submission, staff will account for additional time for permitting. Staff will also onboard contractors once the first round of comments are received to avoid unexpected scope modifications that can cause additional costs as well as delays. Now for some conclusions and key takeaways. Staff will move away from project phasing where appropriate in order to avoid confusion amongst membership communications. Staff will build time for permitting and site issues into project schedules. For major projects, staff will include tasks like destructive testing and advanced site evaluation prior to engaging in project scheduling. As part of site evaluation, as-built drawings will be confirmed and tested prior to construction. Clear and frequent communications to the public regarding project timelines will be included. And the Capital Department and Communications Department will hold regular meetings to discuss project progress and communications to the membership. Thank you. this evening, and I hope you enjoy the update on the Recreation Services, Environmental Education, and Member Services Spring Update. My name is Laura Kowalski. I'm the Director of Recreation, Environmental Education, and Member Services, and I look forward to sharing this information with you. Update includes a look at who's recreating with Reston Association through demographics, a recreation past sales update, the Recreation Department updates for the first quarter, and then a look ahead to what's coming in the second quarter, 
a thank you to the Friends of Reston, and information on the Community Survey Implementation Plan. This is a glimpse into the 2024 demographics from January through March 15th on who is participating in Reston Association Recreation. As you can see, 80% of the participants come from a zip code in Reston, with the highest percentage in the South Lakes and Hunters Woods Dogwood districts. We've had 147 reservations across our community buildings in the Conference Center, Brown's Chapel, Glade, and almost half of those have been at the Lake House. Programming has just kicked off for the spring and registration for our camps is the most popular program type. Of our all ages programming is the most popular at 39%, followed by the infants and toddler programming. As we move through the year, especially with our busiest time during the summer, we will report out on and you can watch these percentages change. For recreation passes. For members, the pass is all inclusive with pools, tennis, and pickleball all included. For non members, there are options for all access or just a court pass. New this year, the recreation passes for members is included in the annual assessment. Members will still need to activate the recreation pass the same way they have purchased in the past or create an account. There is no additional fee. With this change, we have seen an increase of over 2,000 passes activated from this time last year. Non-member recreation pass sales are slightly down. Aquatics Department is gearing up for summer. All 15 pools will be in operation with the exciting return of Lake Thoreau and Shadowwood pools, which have both been under renovation. The pool schedule was reviewed this first quarter for responsiveness to the recent community survey. The current schedule is 84% responsive to when members prefer to swim, and we are working to expand that as we move into the summer. The American Red Cross Lifeguard Certification Program curriculum has been updated. Our aquatics team is certifying all of our lifeguards with that most up-to-date training to maintain safety at the pools. We'll host more than 20 classes through the summer for this update. The Fairfax County Health Department will host its annual Pool Operator Inspector Training Program at Reston Association Pools. This is a great example of the collaboration and partnership we have with the Health Department. Registration for swim lessons opens Monday, May 6th. Other programs open April 1st. Scholarships are available through our partnership with the Friends of Reston for swim lessons, lifeguard certifications, and swim instructor certification courses. Please visit our website for more information. The Reston Tennis update for this first quarter includes registration. Our Reston Team Tennis League registration began and we will host 17 teams this year. Junior and adult program registration is open for lessons beginning in April. Drop-in tennis for recreation pass holders is on Friday evenings and we onboarded our 14 tennis and pickleball instructors. Coming soon in the second quarter includes the renovation of our Glade Clay tennis courts. The tennis courts will see 12 USTA junior tournaments and adult leagues this year. Reston leagues begin mid-April and May 4th, we invite you out for a Reston Tennis Day for the community to enjoy in partnership with the United States Tennis Association. And June 21st, we will host the Reston Mixed Masters for those players that are at the 3.0 to 3.5 tennis tournament level. Our pickleball update for the first quarter includes registration with 72 adults participating and a handful of children. Autumnwood open play continues to be the most popular with over 150 players a day enjoying the courts. Coming soon in the second quarter, classes begin April 1st, teen pickleball classes begin this spring, 
and we will host a professional pickleball registry teaching certification. The Pro Shop is also open for business for shoes, paddles, and more. Rest in Camps is celebrating its 50th year anniversary. We will have a celebration on July 27th this summer. Please look out for more information. Our enrollment this year is anticipated to be over 2,000 campers, and we are currently 65% enrolled. We also have saved spots for at least 30 children through scholarship funding by the Friends of Reston. As you can see, summer looks amazing with all of the program offerings that we have listed here, from nature tots to day camp, tennis, aquatics camp, adventure camp, watercraft camp, junior lifeguarding, and counselors in training. We have a camp for all ages. We invite you to come out to one of our boat rental locations or to participate in the class this summer. Lake Am Dock and Lake Audubon Boat Ramp will be open for business on Saturday, May 25th of Memorial Day weekend for programming and rentals. Fun this summer includes a rental on your own or visiting Lake Ann during one of the festivals to experience it on the lake or maybe a private group. Organize a kayak or stand up paddleboard rental. We have lessons for any group but also invite Girl Scouts, corporate teams, and any private event request. Stand-up paddleboard lessons and yoga will be expanded after another successful pilot program last summer. Registration opens on May 1st. Volunteer Reston has had a busy first quarter. We hosted over 75 volunteers at the MLK Day of Service projects at the Kathy Hudgens Community Center at Southgate. We've hosted a community cleanup with over a dozen Cub Scouts and their parents on March 16th. Volunteers picked up litter at Dogwood Elementary School along Glade Drive and RA Paths. And we hosted a Habitat Heroes on March 23rd at Walter Point Lane Natural Areas. Coming soon in the second quarter proves to be just as busy as the first. We will participate in a Founders Day cleanup at Lake Gam Plaza from 10 to 11. Reston's Arbor Day will be held at Polo Club Recreation Area, and the Walker Nature Center's Earth Day will see volunteers from Volunteer Reston. We look forward to April 27th for our Potomac River Watershed cleanup at Hunterswood Shopping Center and the Community Yard Sale and of course, our Spring Festival at the Walker Nature Center, May 4th from 1 to 5. If you're interested in volunteering, please visit our website. We would love to have you join us. This first quarter, the Walker Nature Center hosted the Principles of Interpretive Planning Workshop. This was in coordination with the National Association for Interpretation. Our own staff were in attendance along with other interpreters and managers from several different agencies. It was a great training and we gained some valuable insight from our peers. We now have an automatic door opener at the front door at the Nature House. The electric vehicle charger was installed and is being tested with Reston Association vehicles to develop a standard operating procedure and expansion for RA members. Coming soon in the second quarter is our spring native plant sale. Orders are due April 5th and pick up April 20th. We also will host Reston's Arbor Day. And March 28th, we will have an extravaganza event. We will see May 4th for our spring festival. And we'll have Earth Day activities, bird walks, programs for all ages. And look forward to our environmental short film series throughout the year. A very special thank you from Reston Association to the Friends of Reston, our 501c3, for their continued support for Reston Association members. So far this year, the following programs have been issued as a fundraising activity for this group. Youth scholarships for youth programming to include swimming, camp, tennis, pickleball, and nature. 
the return of Reston Association's Adopt-A-Bench program, and funding for the new electric vehicle station at the Walker Nature Education Center. If you're interested in donating, please visit and donate today at friendsofreston.org. Our community events department had a successful first quarter with trips to the National Harbor's Titanic exhibit, a visit to Capitol One Hall for the Share Show, and a visit to the National Theater for the Book of Mormon. There was a jigsaw puzzle event, and we saw the wonderful return of our beloved Senior Movie Day. The second quarter continues with the fun, with our community yard sale, tea and painting activity, grand reopenings at facilities, movies in the park, dive-in movies, dog paddles, our totally trucks in its 24th year, family picnics, national night out, our end of season pool party, and trips to the Nationals baseball game, sheer madness at the Kennedy Center, and more. These next slides include an update for the action steps for the implementation of the 2023 community survey conducted last summer. The biggest initiative last summer was the community survey. The survey was open for members to provide input into the development of Reston Association's next 10-year facility plan. We saw over 1,700 responses, surpassing the turnout in past surveys. The results are posted on the Reston Association website and updates will be provided to the public quarterly on progress. This executive summary provides insights to the key findings by RA members who have indicated they greatly value pathways and pools and would like to keep and maintain existing facilities open, but with expanded hours, especially pools. One of the key findings is that members who use Reston Association's Parks and Recreation facilities are most satisfied with RA and the related value of their assessment. A staff action is that staff will conduct a review of operating hours for all recreation facilities to ensure responsiveness to the survey where possible. This will be completed in the first quarter of this year. As you can see with the action steps, this is well underway. In January, staff completed a review of the community survey section on hours of operation and use. We developed a process for reviewing the current schedule to compare it to community survey findings and preferred times that members would like to use the facilities. And finalize the opportunities for responsiveness in a report. This March, we are working with Reston Association departments and external organizations on a schedule change. Working with the communications department on edits and marketing for the new schedule for the website, print, and social media material. This April, we will present the findings to the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee through an information session. We will post the rest on the Reston Association website and promote to the recreation pass holders through a variety of tactics. For the development of the pool schedule for 2024, we will have Lake Thoreau and Shadowwood pools open after being closed for renovation. There will also be an additional 400 hours added based on the community survey results. The schedule for this season will be released on the website on April 1st. The next key finding update is that members are far more interested in maintaining and in some cases expanding usage opportunities for our current parks and recreation facilities than they are in investing new facilities. The staff action related to this is to review the existing capital improvement plan to ensure facility maintenance projects are planned for recreation facilities. As you can see in the action steps, staff have reviewed the existing capital plan and identified projects that support the results of the community survey in January. In February, we finalized and released an RFP for the 2024 reserve study. 
and currently we are finalizing contracts and awarding a reserve study vendor. And then April, we will begin the work on the reserve study. Another key finding is that rest and association pools are used by almost seven out of 10 members. They are the second most frequently used facility type besides trails, and they are widely valued. One item that staff will take action on is exploring credit card point of sale at all pool facilities. In addition, we'll explore other e-commerce opportunities. This will be an ongoing action to help support things like concession sales and other purchases at the pools. For the action steps, in February, an internal team was identified for the project. And in March, we've identified action steps for project exploration to include existing and alternative points of sale options, on-site testing at locations, evaluation of the testing sites and training process, and then provide staff training on the application, which would be identified. Then in April, we would deploy applications identified for point of sale and continue the evaluation for service. Thank you for listening. We look forward to seeing you around Reston this spring.
Three, two, one. We are back in open session, and we need a motion, a cleansing motion, please. Move that the Reston Association Board of Directors certifies to the best of each member's knowledge that only those matters appropriate for executive session of a contractual nature, personnel matters, or consultation with counsel were discussed or considered by the board during executive session. Second. Second by Director Johnson. Discussion? Hearing and seeing none. All those in favor will say aye. 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 <coughs> that Director Perry. Star six. One you, Margaret. <coughs> Director Perry, you need to hit star six to unmute yourself. Oh, you go. There you go. Go. Thank you, Brittany. <laughs> Director Perry, do you vote in favor of the cleansing motion? Yeah. And that is uh, unanimous of all those present in voting. Do you have other motions? Move that in accordance with the association's policies on purchasing and procurement to approve the contract with Red River Technology for managed information technology services in the not to exceed amount of $743,752. Second. Second. Second by Director Petrine. Uh, any discussion? <coughs> All those in favor will vote aye. 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 Director, aye. It's unanimous of all those present and voting. Director Jeshek. Move to direct the CEO to negotiate an extension to the Lamar consulting contract and bring it back to the board. Second. Director Johnson seconds. Uh, there's discussion. We're ready for a vote. All those in favor will say aye. 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 Director Perry? Nay. No. Okay, that's uh, Director Mapar, Director Jeshek, Director Greywich, Director Flashman, Director Johnson, Director Petrine, Director Dodd. Okay, Director Perry votes no. Next. Motion to extend the meeting until 12.30 a.m. I have a second. Second, second by Director Petrine. All those in favor will say aye. 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 Okay. Director Perry? Nay. All right. Director Mapar, Director Jessack, Director Petrine, Director Johnson, Director <laughs> Flashman, Director Greywich, Director Dodd. And Director Perry votes no. Move to direct the CEO to have a conversation with Friends of Rest and President regarding the proposed bylaw amendment to review, remove the voting or approval rights vest it with Reston Association. Second. Director Johnson seconds. Discussion? <clears throat> All those in favor will say aye. 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 Director Perry, that you voted aye? Yes. <laughs> That's unanimous of all those <clears throat> present and voting. Move to direct the general counsel after the consultation had by the CEO to take all necessary to take all actions necessary up to and including sending a letter on behalf of the association to oppose the proposed amendment to the Friends of Reston bylaws, which removes the Reston Association's authority to elect the directors of Friends of Reston. Second by Director Johnson. Second. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Director Dodd. Um, discussion? Hearing <laughs> seeing none, all those in favor will say aye. 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 That's unanimous of all those present and voting. Move that the Board of Directors hereby affirms that Reston Association as the sole member of the Friends of Reston is opposed to any amendment to the Friends of Reston governing instruments which attempts to remove the voting or approval rights vested with Reston Association. Second. Second by Director Mappar. Discussion? Hearing and seeing none, all those in favor will say aye. 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 <clears throat> Director Perry? Aye. It's unanimous of all those present and voting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, move, move, not done yet. Move to direct staff to create a policy which limits and or eliminates donations from residential landowners who have not accepted Reston Association's request to become members. Is there a second? There's a second. Second by Director Mappar, second by Director Dodd. Uh, discussion? All those in favor will say aye. 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 <clears throat> OK, 
Okay. Uh, any opposed? Director Perry? Yeah. What's, all right. So, Director Mappar, Director Jushak, Director Graywich, Director Flashman, uh, Director Dodd. Our eyes, nays are Director Johnson, Director Katrine, and Director Perry. What else we have? That's all I have. Okay. <clears throat> Is that all the business we have for this evening? you have a motion on anything else? New business. I'm sorry? New business. No business. New, new business. Go ahead. Um, Can you really say that at 12-14? It's, it's an easy one. Can we, can we make the annual meeting hybrid? Um, the concern with having an annual meeting hybrid was that um, it would be that I can talk to you about this afterwards. Okay, because it was hybrid last year and the year before it was virtual. I understand. The year before we had COVID. Last year we had COVID too, but it was hybrid. I understand. <laughs> we, we don't have that this year. The, 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 the concern is that the, me, any, the me, members have an opportunity to talk to the board here at any time hybrid. At the annual meeting, we, don't, we have a limited amount of time. And if somebody really wants to talk to us, Come on in. I, 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 I do think, sorry, hand off. Director Perry. I do think one of the issues is that there are at least some people who are up for election or are current board members who cannot be at the annual members meeting in person. And that is part of why the request was made. So, so the, the meeting will be streamed, and the only thing that hybrid gets you is the ability to make comments. And the experience is that the comments in the past have been um, not exactly germane to the business of the association. Um, those who really want to talk to us come to the, these meetings. And, and, you know, we don't want to go on for so long. So anybody can stream it, and they'll be able to stream it. The only issue that hybrid adds is the ability for people to make comments, and, and that's why the choice was made not to have a hybrid meeting. Oh, is that satisfactory explanation? <clears throat> Director Jeffsack. I've, I've said this before, but I think that all board board meetings and to me annual meeting is board meeting because we're it's the elections and all, the entire board is expected to be there um should be hybrid i think that there are people that we won't hear from if if we don't make them hybrid so but the problem is that a comment made at, a, at, a, at the annual members meeting the annual the members can't do anything with that comment so this is a comment directed mm -hmm. at the members i know okay and nothing, can, and nothing can come of that comment. I'm aware. Okay. We don't make anything mostly. That's the reason comments that we get not, why every we're streaming meeting. it and not hybriding it. Um, oh, go ahead. Blame Joel. Um, um, yeah, and, and to, be, to be perfectly honest, I feel like if we've got the technology to make it accessible to folks, um, it's kind of uh, ableist for us not to allow it. No, it, we are. It's going to be streamed. Streamed, but not to allow them to fully engage. It's different, yeah. If someone has a motion, bring it. Director Flashman. I have another item on new business, and it's merely a comment, and that is since the Lakes Equity Working Group now has a new chair and vice chair, it is without any contact with the board. Okay. I'm, I'm out of a job. <laughs> no, the late, the Amazon hasn't been appointed. So I was I'm, the, I'm reading the room. Chair. Can we stick with the prior? The, yeah. I'm reading the room. We want to have the annual meeting hybrid. And I hope you all sit through all the comments. And if you leave, I'm going to call you out. <laughs> <laughs> I'll sit through. Being rude. Well, and I think it's wonderful to allow those, you know, if you guys are lucky, I won't get voted back in and you'll be able to hear my, you know, speech saying, thank you, have a nice day again. <laughs> Marvelous. 
Okay. Thank you. Now <clears throat> on to Mr. Flashman, I think, is hoping that we will vote to appoint him the liaison to the Lakes Equity Group. Can I have that motion? Do you need a motion? Yes. Okay. I thought that you... No, wait a minute. I do it. I yeah, do it. You have the authority. Yeah, it's 1220. <laughs> Great. I, I, Whitney, Plus. he's the... Um, <laughs> Whitney. Brittany, he's in. <laughs> <laughs> We have a lobbyist named Brittany Whitley, so I'm con complaining that. I'm, I'm, having a, I'm, sorry, I'm having a stroke, guys, right in front of you. Is there any other business? We had a long discussion about another piece of business. Is someone going to make that motion? Give me a second. I thought... We have the proper language. We have Tony's language. No, I was temporary. All right. <laughs> I assume we're talking about contractual uh, nature yes. here. Okay. Uh, move. Pardon me, Brittany, as I'm doing this on the fly. I thought this would be done. Um, move to direct staff. Excuse me. Move to direct council to provide. Move to direct the president to receive a the uh, updated contract for the CEO um, to be presented to the CEO. Do we need a date? No, but you do need to memorialize the change we made that you guys the, the wanted to, to make. 60. With, and, and I do not have the exact section in front of me, but with the... Just has to say it as amended. As amended in the executive session. Right. Thank you. Move, move to direct the board president to present the updated CEO contract to the CEO as amended in executive session. Good job. That, that, that could have been done. The, that could have been done on the first time. So at 1220, nicely done. Motion by Director Gray, which is second by Director Petrine. Discussion. Hearing, seeing none, all those in favor will say aye. 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 Director Greiwich, Director. Aye. Thank you. Director Perry, Director Dodd, Director Mapar, Director Greiwich, Director Johnson, Director Flashman, Director Petrine. Those opposed? Director Jeshuk. Is there any further business before the body? Hearing and seeing none. Adios, judges. <laughs> Adios.